Right, this is going to be another episode of Banter Give and Go. And as promised, you will all notice if you watch the past episodes, it is the season now. Actually, we have to talk about real NBA going on right now, not just boomer stuff that you all pretend to know about and look up, look up on Wikipedias. So, obviously, the season has begun, but if you know anything about how the NBA works, I mean, it's why, actually, I have always thought, traditionally, that approach they take where it's almost like sort of like around Christmas is when you actually start to basically care, because if you're actually good, that's when you, like, figure out the rest of the problems and you, you do the big push towards this part of the spring so you know where you're going to be in the rankings. Basically, even though the games have begun... I don't think he could take like the first whatever five, eight games as some sort of like sample size in the NBA. The NBA, like it's one of the actual flaws with this sport actually is that you do essentially spend half the season playing people who aren't going to be in the playoffs. So actually you can actually have records that are fraudulent as hell. Meanwhile, you can have those teams where they're only going to creep in the playoffs, but you just watch the actual games against the top teams and they're killers. Like they're amazing. So I thought what we do is even though the season has begun, we're going to do sort of an NBA season season preview but um, if you know my style I don't just do preview like the beginning it's more like we try and like project forwards through the season who's going to be good who's going to so I'm going to use some classic esports terminology here so people will know I'm actually quite strict with how I use terms like contender dark horse other people use them fairly liberally for me the categories I thought we could look at and we'll put different teams into different boxes and we won't do them all, we'll just do the ones we're interested in talking about. Goes like this, you've got contenders, right? Mike's category for that is, you. Are, that means you are one, an elite team in whatever context and two, you you are a credible team to win the championship this season. Not as in like you could fluke it in a bit, no, no, as in like you look at all the factors and this team should be able to win. So as a result, like you'll notice it, I do in Counter-Strike, I'm actually pretty... Um, I actually keep it pretty strict in Counter-Strike. Like, I don't usually let... I think I always say the sign to me that you're in an amazing time in Counter-Strike is when I actually can pick five teams I really think are, like, contenders. If I get to that level, then it's probably straight fire. Now, obviously, if you've watched any CS recently... That is, and there can be the exception that proves the rule, which was when essentially there just wasn't any really good teams for a while, and it's like about six teams could win. So it can go the other way. After contender, obviously I do dark horse. Again, some people blur these. For me, a dark horse is somewhere where, like the name suggests, you shouldn't actually expect this team would win. It's more like me or you's got some specialist reason as to why we're picking that they'd win. Like, you know, maybe one player's going to overperform, or there's some angle that people don't appreciate, or the coach is going to do a way better job than you expect with the roster. Something like that. So dark horse is more like you could maybe win or do like a deep playoff run but it's not as as expected and I thought the obvious fun one to do because let's be real we're not going to waste our time talking about like the bottom 16 teams of the NBA it's more like let's pick some where people are going to think in fact they probably will be playoff teams but they'll flop they won't have a deep run. They won't win the championship. They might have some of the best players in the NBA, but they won't do anything. And obviously, as always, like all analysis, some of this is going to be completely wrong. Some of it will be right. We may refer to the stuff that was right and sound like we always know what we're talking about by just ignore the stuff that's wrong, as per usual. So, Maui, let's just start out right at the top. You can pick for any category. It doesn't have to start with the contenders if you don't want. But if you want, we can start with contenders. What team initially would you put on the docket that you think are going to do well? Um... I, th- I think that there's the one team that has kind of struck me to be like a pretty marked improvement from last season and is the Philadelphia 76ers. So uh, the, of course, I think that the debate from the previous season was like, is Embiid really deserving of the MVP award when Jokic actually beat him in a couple of categories and in some, in a lot of ways played more winning basketball, but it's not really about, Embiid for me when I talk about the Sixers and why they are proving to be a contender this season for me. It's the fact that under Nick Nurse, because in the offseason they switch from Doc Rivers to Nick Nurse, it does seem like they've emphasized a couple key facets which they were sorely lacking in the previous season. One of which is that they are now pushing the ball a lot quicker. The pace of the team has drastically increased. They're more of a fast break team. Another is that they've given more responsibility to a fourth year guard in Tyrese Maxey and this guy has just blossomed already. He's really he's really popped off the page for me in terms of how he's able to facilitate, how he's able to be fairly efficient and whereas Harden would sometimes just kind of stop the ball, stop the motion and doesn't didn't really give too much of a a rat's ass on the other side of the ball. I think Tyrese Maxey is a more complete player. He seems to have more hunger right now and if you look at just the pure numbers right now 
He's scoring 25 points per game on about seven assists, and he's shooting above 40% from three. And he's only 23, so like you would imagine that he's still going to have a, a decent way to go in terms of developing. And there was like this kind of like back and forth between him and Harden, actually, where Harden kind of gave him actually quite a few nice positive words as Harden was leaving. I don't, I don't know, if, I don't know if that really resulted in what's going on here, or it's the combination of coaching. But for whatever reason, I think a lot of people really put a lot of faith in Tyrese Mack as has Nick Nurse in showing that he's just been playing him more. I mean, there's no there's no Harden to take up his minutes anymore. But even beyond that, um, a guy that I never really thought was going to play seriously winning basketball after watching him on the Warriors for a while is another guy, Kelly Oubre Jr., who they added onto the lineup. And it was like a one-for-one. One. They put him in for P.J. Tucker's roles. And I thought... You know, I thought when that happened, I thought, oh, their defense is going to get worse because I watch I've watched Ubre a handful of times. I mean, he was on the Warriors and he was kind of like, yeah, he can score, but he didn't seem like to be a good, good system player. But now he's definitely giving more effort on defense. He can score better than P.J. Tucker did. And I, I, it's not like I would say Kelly Ubre is a guy that has drastically changed this team as much as Maxi, but it's another slight improvement for for the Sixers and if you look at if you look at what they're doing in terms of just output in terms of stats and everything like that they're top five in both offensive and defensive rating and they only have a single loss and it's still early in the season I, I want to see how these this team plays against some of the better competition in the league but as of right now I, I'd say the Sixers are in a in a good place where I would I would say that they're going to make the Eastern Conference Finals at the minimum are you going to put them contender then yeah, yeah, they're a contender for me. They are definitely a contender. Ooh, okay, because it, well, it's that spicy right out the gate then, because here's what's crazy, mate. They're in my will flop slash underperform category, because here's <laughs> okay. why. Now, to be fair, obviously, the, each of the, like, that category isn't the same as content. It's not a hard, fast rule. Like, as you'll see from some of the other ones I've put there, like, I am also doing underperform, like, based on expectations, who's on the team, etc. The problem is, like, as you just said, at the beginning of the season, it's gone awesome. And in fact, it's even, by the way, the most tantalizing fool's gold bait narrative for any sports ball writer because obviously now the angle you're all going to do is like look they're better without Harden maybe he was selfish oh wow like Daryl Morey was right to you know it's good they're just going to go with that angle because that was obviously the sexy off-season angle of like what's going on with Harden he's holding the team hostage my problem is this though the down look I actually think it is a positive to lose Harden I actually think unfortunately he'd got to that point where essentially the downsides that had just like it was diminishing returns on the upside year on year on year and in fact you could even see sometimes he clearly didn't care about his own actual like physical shape and so unfortunately like I I didn't have a problem with look I don't like what he did with the rules I didn't have a problem with like Rockets James Harden aside from failing the playoffs so I thought he was an amazing player the problem is the player since then not only has been a diva he just doesn't deliver half the time and quite frankly he's got he, it actually worries me because even though in theory the guy at one point in time was like supposed to be the best point guard in the bloody NBA and some people actually even think that's not a terrible tip Maybe he should have won it over Westbrook that season because he was also fucking insane. At the same, at the same time, bro, this guy managed to go from being a distributor to like another fucking black hole. It's like how yeah. have you, how have you become like mellow two point oh? Except the difference is his whole game was that from the beginning. Like you know that. So to me, it was it was good that they got rid of um, Harden. The problem I have is this, Maui. I even do like the pick up the coach. Like by the way, if you told me you were gonna have a roster like this, Nick Nurse is almost like perfect casting because actually even though people will know oh, I remember when he won that like title it's like yeah look at the team he won with though that wasn't some super team that was like he had a really good piece and then he actually had a couple of pieces that on any other team by the way dude are at the bottom of the starters bench you know what I mean they're like fourth fifth like that actual team was quite a well balanced squad and they clearly actually probably did have good coaching and a good setup like it wasn't like you know the players just played and this guy was just an idiot telling him like yeah great job he pat him on the back like, he obviously did do something and then I don't blame him at all for after Kawhi left like, what do you expect? Like, they had nobody at that point in time for real. Like, Fred Van Vliet is supposed to just carry the team. You know what I mean? Like, at that point in time, like, it was totally fair what happened with that team. So, I think he definitely deserves another shot. My problem is, that's why I actually think they'll be fool's gold, though. Because this looks to me, unfortunately, like, when you're risking all those players, like a team that could get a really good regular season record, they could be, like, second, third in the conference. But, mate, I, I have to see this team do something in the playoffs. That's my problem. Because my immediate concern, now you have lost Harden, is... 
if we're in a playoff series, a best of seven, who is your elite perimeter player? The players you listed, it's like maybe, you know, the potentials that maybe they could do it. That guy you're talking about who was like there last season looks like, if anything, here's another factor, by the way. In the same way as I told people, the best thing that could ever happen for Frozen in mouse sports in CS was Rops leaving because it just gives you room to grow and see if you can be the man, as it were. That's what that guy has a chance for. In fact, actually, that's the bonus of someone like Harden leaving. Now you get there's not, there's not someone holding the ball. He's going to have a chance to have it. His own chance to run the offense, etc. The problem is, I have to see him do it in the playoffs. So I think this is a team where I actually do think, as a team, they look like they'll be good. They look like they've maintained the same defensive fucking prowess that the Sixers always had. If you have Embiid, by the way, by the way, later on, spoiler, I will put him as an MVP candidate again. He could easily win again. In fact, if anything, I might even say that. I think this season he might actually even be more of a lock because without Harden, surely he just goes fucking crazy and has perma green light at all points in time because everyone knows Harden was one of the most criminal players for doing like the like. The, the three-point shot that you shouldn't even take, like, at the end of the clock, where it's like, there's a million people you can pass to, and you just do it anyway. So, I actually do think the team, like, in theory, the team will, like, pretty soon, they'll be a better regular season team. I just don't know if they can be a deep playoff team. That's my problem with this squad. It, it really does depend on if Tyrese Maxey is actually fool's gold, or if this kind of jump up in performance that we're seeing at the beginning of the season is sustainable. And as it stands right now, that's a, that's just a question that only yeah, time will be able to answer. So I, I, I'm not really too sure also about the, the rest of the lineup. Like there's not too many people I can trust on this team necessarily. Like, um, like right now, I would say like your best player for the Sixers is obviously Embiid. Your second best player is Tyrese Maxey in my eyes, but your third is Tough. It's tough. Like, is, is it Tobias Harris, who I've been saying is overrated on another episode of this podcast? Is is it Kelly Oubre Jr.? Because then I, I just kind of can't trust that you're actually going to be able to go deep. I, I want to just say that it's probably Tobias Harris, but that's not really uh, a confident pick. And I, for a team, I guess the thing is with definitions here, you definitely, you like your category for contender, I would assume is probably a little bit slimmer than mine. Like, I would probably put four or five teams there, but I would assume I have less. I have three at the moment. Yeah, you yeah. have three. Okay. So you're yeah, you're tighter with the with the yeah, name. Yeah. Than just and right also there. if you notice, this is quite similar to how I do it in CS. Like in CS this is like, essentially, this team's like an ends type team. It's like, you don't really have the superstars. So I can't just look on paper and go, right, yeah, you definitely do it. But the problem with that scenario is like, I just know that people, are, like the problem is there's lots of people have the potential to do it, but until I know they can consistently do it, I might even like the way you play. Like I actually imagine, by the way, this team will play really good basketball. They look like defensively, they'll be sharp. I bet the offense is going to run like twice as good over the season. My problem basically just is, one, Embiid already, I mean, it's actually just a natural flaw being a big man, already had some issues at certain times in playoff games. People know he could foul out. He could shit at free throws. All the classics that everyone knows, it just beleaguer the big man. So the thing is to me, like I say, obviously, it's going to come down to like where is your Jamal Murray where's your like a perimeter player who's going to go off and take over in the series because I actually also think with the coaching put it this way your prediction what's funny is both our things could be the same like maybe they actually can't make the conference finals like the rest of the team looks solid enough the question is can they win there because I do kind of think like playoff basketball is different and there's there's a million people who could get like an all-star nod but still have never done that great in a best of seven series you know just the way the NBA is nowadays that's one thing, though, that I do like about the fact that it's Nick Nurse, because I think the most famous adjustment he made in the NBA Finals that he ended up winning, sure, the Warriors were like Clay was injured, Durant was injured, so it wasn't like he had to do the craziest thing, but everybody was freaking out about the fact that he changed his defensive scheme to a box in one to just put the single man on Curry in just like, just hound Curry, have the other four players play a zone defense, essentially, and if you have one guy that's always on Curry, that's pretty much the entire catalyst for that team, and so if Nick Nurse is able to just pull out little pragmatic ideas like that, I think that this team could easily, easily get out of the East, and then at that point, depends really who comes out of the West. I'll do one of my contenders then, right? Here's what's funny. I'm actually, for this one, I'm going to go in order. I actually, spoiler, I don't think actually the Nuggets are the favorite to win the championship. I actually think one of the things that does show how well Jokic played last year and actually that Jamal Murray overperformed a little bit is I don't even think they were the best last year. I think they, in the playoff series they won, they looked awesome. But I actually think aside from that, I can see why actually some people thought it was fluke or whatever. Or that actually, to me, it was that I think a lot of the other elite competition was quite fucking whack that year. Like the Jokers, the, the real team that was 
were supposed to play to make themselves look good was the Celtics. And the Celtics didn't even bloody get there because they fucked it up completely. So, like, in that one, I don't blame the Nuggets. You've got to beat who's in front of you. But if you look at, like, mate, the Lakers should... In a real NBA, the Lakers aren't even in the playoffs that season, if you know what I mean. Like, the problem the Nuggets had was it was just a bit of a cakewalk. Whereas I, do, I actually think this season, it's a way stronger NBA. I mean, look at all the fucking off-season moves. I mean, the amount of stars that have gone viable places now. So the key thing is, I'm actually going to put my number one favourite, the same favourite I've had the last couple of seasons, going to be the Celtics again. Because again, if you just want to look at an t- NBA team top to bottom, what a fucking... By the way, this GM is just killing it. Every season. Like, even when they let players go, oh, you'll never replace this guy. Well, you know what? The Paul Zingas guy was always like a good player. Now, if you look at his contract, he's getting very well paid nowadays. But like, he j- the problem he had before was he just never found the right fit. Like he was good on teams. He always looked good. But the problem is they tried to make him, if you remember, like the next Dirk Nowitzki, if you remember that era. And the problem he has is he's clearly not in the NBA like a number one option. But I'll tell you what, mate, if you're just going to add him to a team like this that was already really good, fucking hell, this guy actually could put you over the top. Like, I really think this is a banger move, mate. Like, I, I had my own questions about the whole Marcus Smart thing. This looks looks great and so you look at the squad they've still got everything else you want they've got defense they have amazing offense they have actually a fairly deep team and then at the same time if he ever just by the way goes to the, the last five percent like spoiler tatum's in my mvp discussion later on like he can be the best player in the nba when he wants to be so i actually think this team is loaded me I, they're, they're my number one team for now if they can lose they can lose but i think this team has a very good chance against anyone the celtics to me are if if i had to just go like put money on any team. I, I actually said last year that I would have had the Celtics as my favorite kind of during mid season or so. And I would probably have to pick them once again. I, I think that this team just like they suffer from the problem, which is that when we when I've talked about NBA teams before in their construction, it is better to have one S plus tier all star superstar than it is to have one a tier superstar or like three a tier superstars like it's it's just simply the nba has proven before if you yes. have like the best player you can be the best team even if the supporting cast isn't necessarily there for them and that's the thing where a lot of it to me actually does come down to tatum where i watch i watch tatum play i, I watched him play actually the timberwolves recently or had the celtics play the timberwolves recently and and the thing is like he wasn't even the most impressive person on the floor it was anthony edwards on the timberwolves to me and that's where sometimes i just get a little bit lost with tatum where he has a he has a really He's like, he's like A minus at everything. And I, the, what sucks is that that means he's just A plus at nothing to me. Whereas other people, like there's always some little specialty that they have. With Jokic, it's his distribution or just always making the right play. With Curry, it's his three-point ability. I mean, even you you look at someone like Durant, I mean, it's the fact that he can score from the mid-range at will. Like there's all these little things that are just like, they're one signature specialty. And Tatum to me, just so so good so versatile as a player you and mean he's he, your he, Wu in that regard yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he's a little <laughs> okay. bit like Wu okay. to me where he's he's doing a lot of things incredibly well but he does doesn't jump off the page at any one one thing in particular and to me unfortunately that that leaves me left wanting a little bit with the celtics where i would say that God, by the numbers, I would probably just have to put pick them as my favorites. If I were, especially if I were like a bookmaker or something like that, I would probably give you the worst odds to pick the Celtics. But I would also say like they have the li- highest like I'll say this: they have the highest likelihood to w- make it to the finals. Like I would, I would pick them over anybody to make it that far. And in that point, you just have to put them as a contender. And for my money, that makes them a contender because, like I said, my category is a little bit looser than yours, where you're only having a few teams, and I'm probably going to have five here. So. Other things is that like the the addition of Porzingis, like you said, has just been it's been great. They've kept they kept Horford, who is actually doing really well in the second unit too. And then Porzingis had a had one game when he played the Sixers recently, where he was actually scorching the Sixers. Like he was looking really good. They didn't end up winning. They lost um, by three points. But Porzingis in that game had a, had twenty nine points. He looked like one of the best Celtics out there. And they could he's just another safety valve for this team where. One is that his shot release is so much faster than Horford's. So if you just leave this guy for a little bit too long on the perimeter, he's to me, he's a better three point shooter than Horford was. He has he's a quicker release, too. And so if someone like Tatum or Jalen Brown or even Drew Holiday, if they're holding the ball and they need to pass it out to somebody, one, he's got a huge wingspan so he can catch the ball from anywhere. And two, he's just going to get the shot off really quickly. And so that those things matter in like really tough when the defense is playing really hard on you for a full possession. Having that safety valve is so important. And I really think that Porzingis is, is starting to show so many of the capabilities that we were hoping for when 
when he was first coming into the league. It's like it's finally starting to equate to winning basketball. I would just say my analog for Tatum basically is Device before he became Astralis Device and won all the MVPs. Like, it's somewhere where if you know the game, you know that, like, they have the game. They have the skill set. Like, the, it's everything you want for them to be potentially the best player. The thing is, they've just got to get over whatever it is in those big clutch games that they keep fucking up. So, to me, the reason I give that an an analogy is because... Every moron now is going to go, it was obvious device would be great. Dude, you remember what it was like back then. Everyone used to tell me I was a moron for going on about device and Astralis. Like, to every pleb, they, there was nothing there. They thought it was just like, he's just a loser, isn't he? And it's like, to, if, if you actually could see the game, he was this far from being the person he is now. Like, it's not like he, it's not like he got 20% better at CS. He just overcame whatever blockage he had, and then his game just, just flawed at that point. So to me, it is good. Put it this way, they won't win if he doesn't get over that issue. He's definitely going to have to. But... To me, when you have a player that good and you assume they are aware of it, you just keep giving them chances. You just load up and you go, right, what about this year? What about this year? And then you hope, and it does tend to happen. I will say, one of the cool things in general I'll say about sports is as long as your GM doesn't completely gimp you, most of these players eventually do seem to figure it out, you know. It's the same thing in Counter-Strike. Like, notice by the end, it really was only like Nico and Guardian and Guardian had his own reasons who didn't win the major. Like, by the end, all the super-duper great players, eventually, the point is they're so good, they give themselves like six, seven, eight, nine, ten chances. So, same with Tatum. He's had like three, four and now but you, at the same time people forget he's still really young he's still really young guys that's one area is people are over it he's not some like 29 year old guy who's like oh maybe he's not going to make it like he's still in this couple of years if he gets together this year or next year his career will be fine and I actually do think even though now everyone's making the like Wembyana fucking comparison I actually think he is the closest thing to a modern day Kevin Durant as well because he's just got the all round game so he just can basically score in all facets of the NBA so yeah that, that's my obvious clear cut one do you want to do what, what you do next contender dark horse where are we going now um we, we could stick with contenders i mean if yeah i mean there's a couple others that i'm i'm still like pretty high on some of these people but like because i'm actually surprised like, that you're saying yours goes five deep like look i do actually think like i say i think there's a lot of talent but i actually think a lot of the teams have like an obvious flaw so who else who else are we going for in contenders here 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 I'll, I'll give my five i'll give my five and we'll, we'll pick from one of them cool. okay so i think that my the pe the two teams i think that are very likely to make it out of the west are the nuggets and actually the warriors the teams i think okay. i think can make it out of the east Obvious are bias, Sixers, but okay, keep going. celtics and bucks so i think those those three on the east okay I, so so the i mean i'm i'm down to talk about the warriors because i've watched like everything they've done so far so that's so wait a minute, that was nuggets the nuggets the warriors yeah uh, and then on the on the east, it's the Sixers, Celtics, and Bucks. So you didn't, I've seen did, some. Oh no, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've seen some flaws with the Bucks that I I think that they'll remedy throughout. Like it, it's just like early days with the Bucks right now. Their defense just looks way worse, uh, which I think is just because you're you're playing with um, with Damian Lillard. And sure, Lillard can create a little bit more, but he is kind of like the first domino that always seems to fall in these defenses just like the the way that practically every other guard in the league can just get around him so so easily is kind of a shame because what was nice is that you would have hoped that i mean him for drew is was never going to be like like there's so much polar opposites in terms of what you're getting from a starting point guard and so like you're getting a guy that has great perimeter shooting can be a pretty so solid distributor in damian lillard versus drew who isn't really a huge threat on offense he's good he's he's all right like i'd say he's probably lightly above average in guards in the nba but not really counting on to do that but he's actually like i mean he was a very good defender and so now you've kind of shaped up shook up the the outlook of the bucks and it, they, they have looked worse for it and i i don't know like it's just because like it's kind of to me before this season started i thought on paper that this team would have been good enough that i would have Want, I would have expected that they could make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, but now that I'm watching a little bit more of them, I might have to shade them a, a little bit lower. They might have to exit this contender tier, which might leave me with just four teams. So that's that's kind of where I am with them. But I think when you have Giannis, it's again one of those you have you're going to have the best player in almost every series that you play. I'm actually surprised you're so down on them. Like, look, I do agree. They didn't look that great initially so far. But if you just look fundamentally at the team, I actually think this is a true content. It's one of my three. So it's probably going to surprise okay. you. It's probably some I haven't got in there that you have then. Because first, right, the obvious issue they might have is defensive. Like, you're obviously right on that one. That was always their problem, by the way. That's so it's why actually, to me, I actually did think that narrative was fucking whack last split season where... 
it's really just because Joe, because fucking Giannis had won so many MVPs. You know that thing where people were like asking him to explain why they like hadn't won the NBA. It's like they didn't have the best team. You dickhead. Like why should they win last season? Like remember the this is the flaw. By the way, whenever you pump up and inflate offensive rules like this. It, you think naively, oh, it's brilliant because it means everyone's scoring more, so it's more exciting. It also means, by definition, stars actually have less individual impact. Like, the point is, in the 90s, when someone dropped 20 points a game, that means that guy is a bona fide bucket that you can just, like, you can stamp down on your fucking, like, scouting report. This guy will score every fucking game. No one can stop him, basically. In the modern day, the problem is, people like Giannis and MB, their issue is, especially because their style isn't, like, can't, free, can't foul me late in the game. Like, they have to just score meat and potato buckets, which they're awesome at doing, but that just doesn't win you a game single-handedly. So, like, the problem they're always going to have is their bench is obviously going to be a massive issue as well. There's another thing you have to consider. So I actually do think, like, the thing with me, though, is this. It's more the potential of the box as to why I have them as a contender. Because I do think if Damian Lillard can just get his shit together, so one, he plays like he used to in Portland, and then two, he just figures out how to play with Giannis. That is just in NBA history the best combo you can have. It's dominant big man and dominant shooting player from the perimeter. Especially, by the way, if the guy who's the perimeter player is also clutch. If you have those two, that is a fucking fab fabulous combo to win in the NBA. It's even actually, by the way, also, assuming you know how to run things like a basic pick and roll, a pick and pot, it's also just mega for how to actually attack the kinds of defenses people play nowadays. Like, that shit's available all day long. So I do think there's a real chance here. And I also do think, actually, this is a team where you look at the starting five they could put out if they wanted to in, like, a playoff scenario. Dude, they've got some pretty experienced players now. Like, there's the other thing. The other thing about the box is, I'm not really looking at, like, individual players. Like, oh, how's he going to do? Develop. Like, they've got some old veterans who are still money. It's still good. And then, if anything, the two stars are bang where you want them to be in their, like, life, their experience. And, quite frankly, first of all, Giannis should be hungry to win more. He only won once. And Tim Lillard, obviously, is super hungry to win. That's the whole reason yeah. he made this whole fuss in the offseason. So, I actually think a lot of narratives, like, I agree with you. If I, if I look at the product they've put on the floor today, they wouldn't be a contender. In fact, they'd actually be, like, potentially a, one of the flop candidates. But I just think he surely get it together. Surely this gets figured out and they, they get they get good. And like I say, I could really see this being, a, like, a really fucking good playoff team if they actually, like, get the shit together with a the lineup they can have. Yeah, that's why that's why I still consider them to be a contender in my eyes. Just like I, they're like my fifth because preseason I would have put them maybe at third, and then just because we've seen a little bit from them so far. But the thing is that the numbers for Lillard so far this season are pretty bad. Like his his shoot his overall scoring isn't terrible. He's he's scoring twenty four points per game, which is I mean for him that's pretty that's about his career average, but it's just that his three pointing has fallen off a cliff. It's like efficiency numbers for him have really fallen off. But like he fell off like. Last season, he shot 37% from three. This season, 29%. That's going to go up. Like, like, And he's taking so many attempts per game. And if you're wasting, you know, in air quotes, wasting possessions by, by just taking bad threes this regularly, if he just scores 6% more of them or something like that, you now have one of the better offenses in the league. So I'm not... I'm, not super concerned about them and it does seem like this is more of a growing pain issue for them whereas on the other hand i've seen some other teams with some really good chemistry just out the gates oh by the way one other thing i'll just throw in there as well even though i would not agree you know how i do it dude i think essentially mvp should go to the best player who also played really awesome that's not why i think an mvp is because i've told you my joke is i consider it what it actually says it is the most valuable player of the nba not his team i hate that shit of mm. like would you, so but i'll tell you what's a joke this is what will reveal how stupid the nba is if the bucks get it together in the regular season and finish top two in their conference and lillard has good i bet they give him the mvp that's how stupid mm. these sports writers are. Even though if he'd played identically on fucking Portland, they'd never even consider him for the MVP. I bet they actually tried to force, if they're one of the top teams, because remember, they also want new people to win all the time. That's the other thing they're all hardy as fuck for. Yeah. So I guarantee, because remember, the one thing, this is one thing as a quick aside, I've always hated about the NBA, is you know when they make those, it's, it's funny because it's the thing you love when you're a noob. You know when they win the championship and they always make that like DVD slash VHS of like the story of your playoff run. But the problem is they don't do it 
it well. Like, they always have to make it some, like, really simplistic sports ball narrative. So it's always stuff like, and then Kobe finally learned how to trust his teammates and pass to them, and then they won the championship. You know, some, like, yeah. like almost like little kids level story, right? They'll try and make it like that, Maui Snake. They'll be like, oh, and finally Lillard realized it wasn't just about him and his numbers. He had to pass more. You know, like, completely ignoring, like, he has an insanely dominant big man now that surely eventually he will learn how to use and abuse in, like, the pick and roll. And also, like I say, he's still going to be shooting the same shots. Like, it's a, I don't know how it'd be different, but that's just my little prediction. If they do well, they will force this guy in the MVP convo. Just get ready for it, mate. Even though, as I say, essentially, they'll just be telling on themselves there because I don't know why he suddenly play if he has a green uniform on that would make him the MVP and then if he had the white one or not. I don't really get that myself, but that's the NBA for you, mate. It's the NBA. I'm, I'm just going to say, if they, if they actually... <laughs> If Lillard actually wins it, it's going to be the first time in history that the MVP isn't on all NBA first team since like the the 1970s or whatever it is. Sure. Like it's been a I think it's been since like something like Bill Russell won MVP but Wilt was the all NBA first team center or something like that. Yeah, it's but get ready such... for that. Dude, they'll also give him the all NBA if this team finishes top. Remember, dude, a lot of those people if you have a look really are fucking like I think the NBA is one of the worst for that. They do some really weird ones where like if you just get on a super team, you just start fucking you just get these awards, mate. It's mad. I mean, the was it like like when Mark Jackson admitted that he didn't put Jokic on his ballot, and then it was like you could. I mean, the thing like that's great about the yeah, NBA <laughs> is you can see people's ballots. Yeah, okay? I think like, that's legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You because you should have people Toss. should there should be outcry if you have a horrible ballot, yes. and then you should just be stripped of your voting rights. That's for sure. By the way, that's actually one thing I wish we had in esports. Like that's actually the thing I think is most cowardly about the Hitchhiker TV Top Twenty. We, now, in theory, it isn't just one guy, but you have no idea who's picking and who's voting anyone where. Because if you don't know. By the way, even though it's crazy, Riot does this. You know, in League of Legends, they actually publish the ballots when people do these, like, all LCS and all, like, who the MVP. And by the way, some of them are dead embarrassing. Like, some of them really are stupid shit. Like, a Portuguese guy just votes everyone from Portugal. Like, like outrageous yeah. shit. But here's the thing. Just knowing who did what, though, is almost, like, comforting, like you say. Like, at least then I know, like, oh, it's this bloody idiot. That's the reason you didn't win. It's, look at this guy. He's just giving everyone Spanish or whatever the fuck. Right, okay. I'll do another one, then. Fuck it. Obviously, my other team, spoiler, you can guess now, my other contender with Vizzles Doom is the Nuggets, right? They just aren't my number one yeah, contender. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Here's, I've, I've alluded to it earlier, but I actually think there's a very strong case, like I said, that they weren't actually the best team last year and they're not the best team now. Because one, I think the problem this team has always had is they're just not that good defensively. It's actually even an area where Jokic has issues. Look, spoiler, yeah. when you are as big as him, you are always going to block some shots and protect the rim. I mean, you have to just stand next to it to do that. But he is not like some god defender. He's not like... Like when people compare him to the other great players... That's where you shouldn't compare him to like Tim Duncan or something like that. Like that's someone who actually might like help shut a game down if he doesn't score, mate. Like Jokic is going to run the offense, score. He's a really good player, he's a mega player, but he's not some monster. So to me, they, they're going to have defensive issues. I just think that's why I say the real reason I think it looked so great last year is look who they played. Like when they played the Lakers. Everyone knows who's ever followed the NBA for the last three years that the Lakers is literally just LeBron fans waiting to just go, fucking Anthony Davis. So we all know they always never have quite enough firepower, which is why every LeBron fan's like, well, get him some help. Get him more help. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, well, who's left out of the Hall of Fame that hasn't joined yet? But anyway, then obviously, same thing in the finals. I told people, by the way, the worst thing that could happen for the finals, because they were all loving that shit. You know what everyone did, like the CSGO thing, Maui, where they go, I love upsets. And they're all like, ha ha, this is hilarious Jimmy Butler is wrecking the Celtics I was like well done dickheads you've ruined the finals you idiots yeah. have fucking ruined the finals because are you ready this is how I'll know if someone watching this show now is a pleb you do know even the same Celtics that lost if they somehow won would have done better in the final I know to your brain you're like that can't be Thorin but they lost that's how matchups work you idiots like one it's a different day they could have been better and then two their team was just way better equipped the problem you had was this the Heat aren't even that good offensively and then they're playing a team that's bad defensively but you don't have the skills to fucking punish them and I told people yeah Jimmy Butler eats up like bad Eastern Conference teams who chalk at the end of the game the fucking Nuggets team was always just going to put like 130 up on the board and it was game over. Like, it doesn't matter how good he does defensively at that point in time, like it's over. So the basically, the point I'm making is this. I think most of those issues are still there for the Nuggets. They haven't really changed anything. And then lastly, even though less, he has year on year been better and better, Jamal Murray, and he is a really good player. Like now he actually is starting to get to the point where that's a pretty scary one too. Everyone is just remembering that fucking Lakers series. And in the Lakers series, like that, he sold his soul to play that series, bro. Like, I think 
like he had like 50% from three or something insane, Maui. Like he was yeah, like, yeah. that wasn't just like even him playing well. That was like actually like, I think the joke is you would have thought that was like a bobble series. Like he played like completely out of his mind. So if he could do that again, spoiler, by the way, he'll be one of the best players in the whole NBA. So I have to just see that before I believe it. So I still think, look, I put them as sort of my second team, basically. I have them, I had it like Celtics first, Nuggets second, and then third was uh, the box, I had the, if the box get together. So I think the Nuggets, good chance to make the conference finals, but... I, I actually think it's plausible they don't win this one. I think actually the joke is, Jokic himself will be doing that same bloody press conference. They just made Gellis do like, so what happened this year? Why didn't you win or whatever? Like, oh, give me a break. Come on, give me your Nuggets <laughs> take then. Okay, my, my take with the Nuggets is that they're obviously dealing with an injury right now. Jamal Murray has a has a hamstring injury. but And the lineup is relatively similar, but they've lost a couple of backups that have given them depth. And that's like Jeff Green, uh, Bruce Brown, and if if they um, if they just keep playing the same way, I kind of I, I do agree with you the de the defense for them. Like when I watch when I watch the Nuggets, one thing that's kind of frustrating is that despite all the great stuff Jokic does, he's he is one of the weaker centers in terms of just being a rim protector. When I watch him play, his positioning is probably the weakest aspect of it, where he'll try to meet oncoming attackers or slashers a little bit further away from the rim. Whereas, and because he doesn't seem to just get that whole verticality and where to stand exactly if he just wants to jump straight up and down. Like, there's a handful of centers in the league that are just great at this. Like, Adebayo, for example, is really good at it. He'll just always be in the right position, just jump straight up and down. Obviously, Gobert is probably just the flat out best in the league at doing this stuff. And with with Jokic, he always kind of, it seems like he wants to like get a little handsy with it sometimes. It's not like he's always catching himself in foul trouble, but it's either like he'll he'll just reach a little bit more than he probably should, or just doesn't know where to stand. So he kind of has to try to bother them with his reach here and there. But yeah, as a, as a team overall, like the offense has run so smoothly because Jokic is, is prob is gotta be the best distributor in the league. And other than like a point guard, let's say, like the fact that they just run it through him over and over and over again, and he so rarely makes any mistakes, means their offense is so formidable and it's so, so in unlikely to be error prone because it doesn't even really need a system. It doesn't even need a ton of passes. It just needs you give the ball to Jokic. He has an incredible assist to turnover ratio, and he's going to find open men so he can find a hockey assist on top of that. So I, I don't see how they're not going to make the Western Conference Finals. Also, I will say, with the style of play he plays, it's why, actually, I don't mind when people do the comparison with him and Larry Bird, because, actually... Like, the thing is, Dirk Nowitzki was just a shooter. He wasn't going to, like, be a fucking point forward or whatever. Like, the difference is Larry Bird also, like, ran the whole game as well, like you're saying. Like, so the thing is, with that sort of a player, essentially, you can also just win series with your mind. Like, they could just win again just off him being insane. But, I mean, I just think at the moment, the NBA partly because of all the player out outrageous demands. It's pretty stacked for talent, though, is the problem. So, like, that's why I say, it, it, as you'll notice as a general rule, I am referencing defense fairly highly as to how I rate these teams. Because I think in the modern NBA, telling me you can score, like, 120 points means nothing. Like, get in line. Like, there's too many teams can say that. So... I, I, I think a lot of this is also on Jokic. By the way, if they win again, I think actually this is a making case he is one of the best players to ever play in the NBA because it's not just a slam dunk he wins with his team. He hasn't just got the most loaded team quite clearly. Right, right. You want to move go to, to uh, yeah, go pick one. So, so my last, my last contender were the were the Warriors, and uh, it's it's from it's a few of like. Is there a little bit of wishful thinking on this? There is, but they've been playing very well. Okay. Like, in terms of net rating, they're top seven right now in the league. And I think that they could even be better because Draymond's not even playing. Draymond's been injured. So they should be a better defensive team. And they probably can like shore up the minutes a little bit because they've been having to actually play with their backups. And like they're playing with a couple of rookies pretty regularly or guys that are pretty young, maybe. I mean, like they have one guy that's playing that is a rookie, but pretty frequently, but they have a couple other guys who are still earlier in their careers and you wouldn't probably see them have this many minutes come playoff time. And yet they have to play them because Draymond's position is just one that needs to, it's a hole that needs to be filled. So they're just using other players. Um, the main reason for this is that last season, they they bowed out to the the Lakers. There was a huge mismatch for them where they were unable to, um, they were unable to really stop like the size. And like the, the thing is that sh the biggest signing that the Warriors got was Chris Paul. So people are going to actually be like, oh, well, you know, they actually downsized. Like they, they got a shorter point guard for Jordan Poole, essentially. So how is that going to help them in these kind of mismatch games? Well, it's actually, it actually is some of those players that I'm talking about who are starting to find some minutes here and there. Like um, Jonathan Kaminga 
And this guy, Trace Jackson Davis, who's a rookie for the Warriors, this guy is like weirdly, weirdly good. And um, he put up some like really solid early, like early game where it was some some ESPN kind of BS stat where it was just like in the amount of time that he played uh, against the Pelicans, like he he had some really like he had above above 50 percent field goal shooting at like 13 <clears throat> points or something. I don't know. They pulled something out of their ass and like and he had four blocks. And it was like the last time that this has happened was something like Shaq, even though it's just like, OK, this is just the most cherry pick thing ever. But continuing to watch him after that and some of the minutes that he's had just seemed like they've been, generally speaking, productive minutes. He's never had a negative plus minus on the box score and he's just overall like like he's a guy that can kind of match up a little bit better i do think that if it's someone like anthony davis he should still get torched but like if you can in some ways just put some of those minutes onto this new guy then there's a little bit of hope right there but the main thing is that this chris paul signing is actually very good for the warriors because their bench minutes before were abysmal last season jordan Poole had regressed so so drastically some of the other youngsters on the team just weren't up to snuff and now the warriors are playing with gary payton the second dario saric jonathan kaminga and Chris Paul like that that second unit is actually surprisingly good Saric is very he doesn't make many mistakes also Chris Paul is like makes probably the, the least mistakes of anybody on this team sometimes even when I watch Curry I think I think Curry makes more mistakes than Chris Paul just because Chris Paul is just like he's he's all about just maximizing every single possession and so with the minutes that Curry is not on the floor I actually can trust this team to not just throw the ball away whereas before it's it was just it was a train wreck in motion i was constantly watching young players try to run a motion offense where they would just do one too many passes or not know what the best shot is on the floor at any given time and everybody has seemed to develop patience like even some of the youngsters like moses moody and jonathan kaminga who were drafted by the warriors they were players before that they didn't know when to take a good shot sometimes they'll like overextend here and there and they've all seemed to tighten up their game pretty drastically which i think is due in part because chris paul's on the floor with them now so the minutes for this bench unit are insane. Like their plus minus has just been so strong and that'll give them to me good, good and better seating than they got last season. And so they're going to have some weaker opposition. And I think that they're going to actually make it to the Western conference finals also, which is why them and the nuggets were my two contenders out of the West. This is one of the teams I actually have highest on my dark horse one. Now, the reason why I didn't put them as a contender goes like this. Because I've done the same thing, as you'll notice, when I, as we do this show. Like I did with CS, I've taught, I have my own philosophy of how the game works and what I value over other things. And so one thing when it comes to winning the championship, I think in the modern day, as you notice, the offensive rules are overtuned to fuck. So the, what I always ask is this, who's your third option, right? Normally that would actually be a massive slight against this team. Because as you've just discussed, like realistically, the third option is either, I mean, you could say it's Chris Paul, but it's not, is it? He hasn't joined the team. It's like you say, it's basically like the fucking Kaminga guy or like Wiggins or something like that. Because again, Draymond Green doesn't get to count for that. He doesn't even try that role. So it's something like that. So normally I would say that's actually a big hit because at least in the past years, they tried for like people with potential for that role. It just didn't always work out, like you said, with Jordan Poole, etc. But I actually do think this is a great example of your two best players are still really good players. By the way, Clay Thompson always was slightly overrated in the sense that, like, his whole skill set is that he doesn't have to be the primary option. That's why he's awesome. Like, the point is, he just kills you in the same way as, like, in the, if you know CS. I wouldn't actually want Magus to be my best player. But if you put him with, like, some other players, that would sick. How are we going to lose? It's why, at the moment, if people saw him take a matter, I, can't, I hate the idea you kick JKS out. Like, you found the best spot for him and your team. Like, you're not going to get a better player. So here's the angle I'm going on now, which is I don't think it matters that they don't have a clear third option. Because, actually, their third option can be done by committee. They've got Chris Paul, who's fucking amazing. They've got these... Co they got, like, a player who didn't make it, but it's still money. We talked about on the other episode. I think Wiggins has always been a skilled player, mate. I actually do think like the, the play you're talking about, it certainly has potential. It's very early on the season, obviously now. But the point there is that gamble doesn't have to pay off. This team's still fine without it. And as you say, the bench pretty deep. And then I'll just throw in there as well. Uh, it is true in the modern day, a lot of the power of coaches has been stripped that by all these big diva players. But actually, I do think that having a good coach is still very important in the NBA, especially obviously once you make the playoffs. And I think Chris, Steve Kerr's money. Like I actually do think all those people who tried to do the same thing to 
to him, they did to his mentor, Phil Jackson. Of like, you don't need me because you got all the best players. Like, you're just morons. Like, you will never understand yeah. this sport yeah. ever in your life. But not least, because as I pointed out in past episodes, motherfucker, we've just been through the era of unlimited super teams who never even made conference finals. Like, what are we talking about with the idea stars just win the game for you? Like, if anything, I think in the modern day, like I said, because the individual star can't just 1v9 the game, the coach has to set the rest of the team up and the bench up and the rotations. Like, it's actually still very important. So I think actually the Warriors is a pretty solid team. So the key thing for me is just like, one, you cannot, and this is a problem, you cannot have like fucking Steph Curry cannot get injured. It's just over, the whole season's over if that happens. And yeah. unfortunately, he can obviously be injury prone himself. If that doesn't happen though, they've still got an outside chance for it. Like, I think they're still a strong team. And actually, I want to go a little bit on the Chris Paul angle. Dude, this is the most slept on move I've seen in fucking like a decade. Because people are acting like this is when he went to the other teams he went to. No, no, no. Some of the other teams he went to didn't make any sense. I don't know why he did some of those moves. This is a fucking sick signing for both parties. One, Chris Paul is mega. I think I'm talking on the underrated episode, I think. I think he's one of the best point guards I've ever seen play. Like, he's one of those ones who deserved that title, like, point god. Like you say, essentially, he really is for me. Like, the difference is, Jokic distributes the ball, but he doesn't play like a point guard. LeBron sort of does, but still doesn't really. Like, he doesn't really seem to maximize his talent that well. Just, just dribbles and then passes sometimes. This guy actually is just a true, like from the textbook, like the John Stockton small shorts type point guy. That guy is just this. But then he's also a straight fire shooter. He's got one of the best mid-range shots I think I've ever seen from a... Remember, most times point guards, the whole reason they do that game is they're not that... They're not actually that awesome at shooting themselves. It's like they set the other guy up. This guy also can just... This is why I've always thought he's sick because he does the dribble penetration. But then he's just got like his mid-range bag all day long there, mate. And it works in the playoffs. And then even though he has this weird rep that he's a choker because he hasn't won... Mate, in actual clutch time in the game, he's very good. I've always thought he's a fantastic player to get you, like, a go-even basket, a go-ahead. He's obviously bang a free-throw shooter. Like, I actually think this is a sick signing. Like, it's a sleeper, mate. This could be what puts the Warriors over the top, not least because, as you alluded to, if I'm them, I do hope the whole premise is Steph Curry is the point guard on the starting unit, and then Chris Paul just runs the second unit. If they do that, then this, then actually now the Warriors are going to be really dangerous. Because the other problem I thought they had in the last few seasons was they're like one of the teams that's ridiculous when Steph Curry goes to the bench. Like they're just going to start losing the game. That's why I say if they're ever injured, it's over. Like so, I actually think this gives them like so much more depth than you'll see on like a box score. Like if you look on the box score now, Chris Paul at the moment has eight point eight points per game. So if you're a pleb, you're like, who gives a shit? Yeah, but what he could actually bring to this team could be so fucking sick. I actually think low-key, this is actually his chance to steal a ring on the way out the door. I mean, the another thing, well, like, if you just look, if you're just combing the box score with this, is that, like, Chris Paul has set over seven assists per game, and he has under one turnover per game. So his his actual creation is so high. Like, yeah, the, point, the points itself aren't that good, but, like, for versus say someone that has more points per game than him, like Kaminga, I mean, Chris Paul is creating way, way more points if you're actually including assists and points. Like that's, and that's been a stat that people have loved to throw around too because Jokic has been so transcendent when it comes yes. to the amount of point creation that like that he's that he's delivering for them i mean if you look at chris paul and you just kind of multiply these numbers a little bit he's he's creating like 24 points per game like that's 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 so strong for a guy that's yeah. like that's that's a bench player essentially yeah. so yeah I, I i think i i'm i'm not really i'm not really sure if they're gonna like if this goes deep and there's like a really bad mismatch how they're going to handle it because I'm I'm being bullish on Trace Jackson Davis and like Looney and Draymond to try to stop bigger players but they are, they are undersized and that was such a hindrance to them come yeah, sure. the Lakers series but if they somehow dodge that like it, it, it's always kind of matchup dependent in the NBA like sometimes a team that's the eighth seed will be able to take down the one seed for for whatever ridiculous reason like they got good perimeter players or something like that but if the Warriors can somehow dodge one of those bigger lineups like the, like the Lakers yeah I actually really think they could hit the Western Conference Finals. Plus, low-key, I also think there's value, like I alluded to about how clutch he is. Just the fact that it's someone else could also hit a late-game shot to win you a game. Like, it's not that Curry's bad at it. He's just not really good at it. It's just not his strength. Like, it's actually been one of the areas he's been a little bit weaker in. But to me, that was never his game anyway. Like... Like the idea, like spoiler, it doesn't matter how good you are. A three point isn't the shot I want to win the game usually, unless it's right. wide open. You know what I mean? So it's it's like the joke is, uh, oh yeah, and also on that Lakers series, let's just throw this out there. One of the things I despise about fucking LeBron stands 
is they talk like he doesn't ever get a call, bro. That series was a disgrace. Like, the, the Lakers themselves yeah. got a billion free throws yeah. and then turned around and went, well, the Lakers got more than us. What the hell? It's like, oh, get... that's how it works, you fucking biased fuckers. So, <laughs> like, I agree. Like, that, it wasn't even obvious that Lakers would have won that series, mate. So, I, I, as long as they don't get into that kind of a scenario, it's totally plausible. I think this team's fine. But that's why yeah, I have them as, like, top of my dark horse. Though. I don't have them in the category for contender. Go what, on, were your, what were your categories again? Like, contender first, then dark horse then people flop, flop or underperform or what okay, the expectation okay, sure. i'll give you another one so here's yeah, a, here's yeah. a fun one because people actually probably be shocked that i have them in dark horse but i'm gonna do it i'm actually gonna say pending getting their shit together the clippers are a dark horse and Ooh. here's why because oh. the only problem they have in their team is if they do like what i was talking about with chris paul if they actually understand like to use harden and westbrook like as second unit players or like when you've got like a mismatch or you're against a team where you can just run the ball they their firepower is insane on this team the problem they have the obvious one is this might be the worst i, I said i thought it was pretty bad with what the suns did this might be the worst example i've ever seen of just putting loads of people who want to be the primary ball handler on one team that's my main fear right now is that this is some stupid like all-star team but then it's like three people who are used to being the one that comes up like right i'm checking for oh, oh wait that's not my turn and then you just wait and watch that guy do it. if they do that they're going to be what's funny is this team could either be dark horse like i say or they could easily go into that will flop category too but i actually do think if you can get it together and the key thing for me is this if you look at their squad I actually think in this team, Westbrook will actually be good. I think this is, I think both where his career's gone and the fucking trauma of what he had to put up within that Lakers team. I actually think he's going to just be, he's going to stay within his game, believe it or not, what he's never done in his whole career, essentially. So I actually think Westbrook will be good. Harden, look, everyone knows I'm like somewhat of a hater because I just despise like the way he chooses to play the game and conceives of himself. But the thing is, if he actually understands he is not going to be the guy who shoots 20 shots, Again, I've seen what he did back in the day on the foot. He could be a fucking amazing off the bench player or play you just play for like 25 minutes a game. The problem is, though, obviously, he can't do any of that bullshit when he comes in fat and then just takes all the shots. And if he does that, he's garbage. So the problem is, I do think actually the underrated part about this team is Kawhi and Paul George are already really good perimeter defensive players. So actually, that almost makes up for the fact that who gives a shit that Harden doesn't play defense? He doesn't need to on this team. So the key thing is, defensively, this team should be good. And it does have the fi- the pieces where if they can get, like figure out some sort of rotation that works, the firepower can be there. Look, I can't actually say they'll win. I mean, just personality-wise, this team could blow up in two games. But I just think, like, at Prince, if I was a coach, this is the sort of team I would want to coach. Like, there is so much to be gained from what you've got on paper here, but you're gonna have, it's clear you're going to have to be creative with it. It's not just you throw them on the floor and they just play and figure it out. So I think the potential is crazy. It's just that, it's obviously, I mean, who the fuck knows actually how they'll do. So I'll put them, I've got them in my dark horse as sort of a surprise for people. Uh, yeah, me, I, you? Come on. I, I guess I guess Dark Horse is fair. Like you're not I, feeling them. I'm not. I'm not loving the composition of this lineup. It's just too many ball dominant players for me. I would say that I like that you gave a shout out to Westbrook because at the end of last season and going into this season, he's been he's been good for the Clippers. But Harden is still. Just I, I feel like he doesn't play winning basketball anymore. I think I think if the Clippers want to have a chance to win the championship, they need to at some points like just finesse somebody and, and do some trade to get themselves like a, a less ball dominant shooting guard. Like like for example, a perfect fit for this team would be like a Clay Thompson. If they got someone like him where he's just gonna play some solid perimeter defense guard the opposing point guard, whatever it is, and just stand in the corner or just run some run some screens here and there. I think he would be perfect, but Harden to me is just not not quite what the Clippers needed here. Um, but the tree, the actually including even Zubach into this, I think like their starting four is pretty good between Westbrook, George, Kawhi, and Zubach. I think that's totally fine. You don't need to touch it. But Harden to me is where like he's taking away touches i want to go to george and and leonard i I want them to see the ball way more i want i want leonard to touch the ball the most of any i want the usage rate to be as like following i want i want to see the highest usage rate out of leonard i wanted to follow that with with george and then harden and then westbrook and i guess zubach is last but i I just think that harden's going to take a little bit too much away from this team 
I because he hasn't really indicated to me with his time with Philadelphia either that he's comfortable just kind of being a role player. He still seems to hold on to these last vestiges of who he was. And I think he's he's having a, a rougher transition to the second to this latter stage of his career to the twilight twilight days of his career, uh, whereas some other players, you know, they, they take it a little bit more gracefully. It's just hard and it has to be a big change in his mentality. By the way, two quick things. One, part of me does wonder, like, did the GM of the Clippers really just do this deal? Because every season his two stars get injured. So it's like, you know what? Fuck it. If we have Westbrook and Harden, we can sort of still play even if one of these guys goes down. Because part of me thinks that, dude. Because here's what I did want to ask you. I am shocked by how many people love that move for Harden to the Clippers. Like, dude, people were really acting like it makes sense for all parties. Like, I don't know if it does. Like, I say to me, it's more like... I can't possibly predict how we'll play. It's just that, like, the rest of the team is good, and it's like, if he can just add offense, then you have got a pretty good team all around. But I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked by how many people sort of think this is a slam dunk. Like, what's weird is, I notice people in the media critique Harden's, like, selfishness or being a diva. They all still seem to act like his game's still going to be straight fire, though. That's the weirdest part to me, you know. It's like people never seem to go as hard on... Put it this way. People go 10 times harder on Westbrook than they do on fucking Harden. Yeah, yeah. We do. It's wild. Isn't <laughs> yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It's not really a fair treatment, actually, at all. I, mm, I don't know if I don't know if that's. I, I think I think if I had, I mean, if I had to pick one over the other, I think Harden is actually better than Westbrook. Yeah, that's fine. But 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 by pretty slim margins at this point in their careers. No, but you said it best, mate. The real problem is this, though: is James Harden only knows how to play as 2018 James Harden for the Rockets. Like the difference is, I actually now believe after seeing it, and like I say, I actually think getting fucking mugged off by LeBron just made Westbrook realize, like, actually, I can just contribute to a team, and as long as people aren't a dickhead to me, I should be really good without being like the man. Like essentially, he seems like he's actually like a fucking dream sort of like point guard slash backup point guard at this point in his career. He's almost like he's finally gotten what essentially should have been his game for a long time, except for the seasons, obviously, when he had no help. Yeah, I, 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 I'm I'm, kind of curious why still media would even be like that high on this move, I guess. Uh, I, I, guess still, the I think they're that doing you... that sports ball thing where they just act like if you sign a big name, you, you're going to win now or some dumb shit like that, you know? By, by composition on defense, actually, this team is is not as not terrible because, by, like, actually towards the end of last season when I was watching the Clippers and how Westbrook was fitting, it was his defense actually was better than he, he was defending for the Lakers. And then you have two incredible wing yeah. defenders in George and Leonard, and Zubac is totally serviceable. So I, I guess like one bad player for defense doesn't always ruin a whole team, but I think those kind of mistakes will actually end up costing them in the long run where, you know, break it down over 100 possessions, and, and Harden's actually going to probably mess up like 12 of them on defense at least. Go on then, pick one. Who are we doing now? Yeah, yeah. This is kind of the one that came out of nowhere for me because I didn't think like based off of what I saw from them last season that I'd even be talking about this team. I thought they'd just be kind of like a, a non-starter. Is it going to be but the Timberwolves? It's... Yes. There yeah, we go. It's the Timberwolves. Go on. Yeah, I mean, if people don't know on a past episode, now we did pick Anthony Edwards as like one of the most underrated players in the NBA. So it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Or he's one of the young guns that's going to take over, I think. I mean, with the recent uh, game, like they played, they played the Celtics. They've beaten now the Celtics. They beat the Nuggets. Um, they're overall, I, th I think that this team is like weirdly, I mean, they're, they're the best defensive team by rating right now, which seemingly shouldn't be a surprise sure. when you have supposedly the best defensive player in the league in Rudy Gobert, but it didn't really transpire last time, but they're playing just better system defense. I think that they're like learning how to like funnel people to, as opposed to in the middle of the season, adding someone like Gobert and then just saying, okay, you got to have to deal with this. I think this off season treated them really well, where they're able to scheme a little bit better and make sure that people know, like, like for example, like, I mean, like a good perimeter defender, even if they're not a good, like lockdown perimeter defender knows how to angle their body to funnel player like opposing players on the offensive end to go to their star center defender and that's kind of what's happening now like gobert is they, like they're actually pushing the ball a lot of times towards gobert's region and because of that he's just so good inside that it's really hard for teams like the celtics for example to to go up against them and even even the nuggets too had a really difficult time playing against the the timberwolves and so the like a lot of the numbers just look really good for them but on top of that when i watch them play the celtics it's it's that yeah, Anthony Edwards to me was the most standout player in that game. He was 
having some incredible pull-ups. He was driving really well. He made a couple of mistakes on the defensive end later on, like his assignments got past him here and there. But he also locked down Tatum when he had five fouls at one point too. So there's like these moments with Edwards where it he puts in actually the right amount of effort. He's not always like on defense I'm talking about. He always puts in a lot of effort on defense. Sometimes it's it, it's a little too gambly for my taste where he kind of tries to reach and then that's when Tatum will blow by him or or Brown for that matter or whoever is playing against him. But it's it's that he's starting to really put it together and I think that the uh like the FIBA World Cup and everything like that really did a lot for this guy's confidence where when Kerr was trying to put together that starting lineup there was at some point where Anthony Edwards wasn't getting all the minutes that he felt like he deserved and he kind of had a back and forth with Kerr which was publicized and and it was like like he he realized he's he's like he's I'm him or he's the I'm, he's the man or whatever it was his line and um, yeah he's just he's just totally showing that now and so for him. the yeah he was he looks like his fluidity on the floor makes me believe that he can be if he's not already uh, a top top eight player in the league and so I think he has to. Yeah, clean some stuff up on the defensive end. But the thing is that they were the best defensive team right now. So he's actually contributing to a winning defensive system already. It's just, if anything, the reason this team is not, to me, a contender is because Carl Anthony Towns has actually had a bit of a regression. I think that with with Gobert on the floor with him, it's a little bit difficult for him to always find his like positioning because the lane gets a little bit more clogged. Whereas before, Towns was the only center and he he like the the spacing was very good around him. Now the spacing's not as ideal because the person that's playing on Gobert can sort of sag off of Gobert and just double up on Towns a little bit more safely because you're not really going to just throw the ball to Gobert in the mid range because he's not going to do anything with it productive. So that's where they need to find a little bit more in terms of contributions for this team is is from Towns to find out how does he get back to the averages that he was having before, even though there's another center that's clogging up the lanes for him. And if they do that, I I, I mean, there's a good chance. For one, I think this team's going to make playoffs. Like, I don't think that's even much of a question for me, If barring injury. If they just keep on this trajectory, they're definitely making playoffs. Do they beat the Nuggets or Warriors? What's what? Again, this is one of those matchups where they could beat the Warriors because yeah, of the size. Yeah, matchup wise, yes. Yeah, like you got Gobert on the floor and you got Towns. Again, Gobert's not going to really contribute to that because Gobert's been Gobert's been torched by the Warriors a million times because all he can really do is play defense. But if you got Towns, Towns is going to be a nightmare matchup. Yeah, the key thing is, I actually did also have these in my dark horse, just a bit lower down, right? The biggest problem, obviously, is that a lot of this, in terms of if we're going to win series, is going to be off Anthony Edwards, and he is 22 years old. But I actually think, bearing in mind when we did that episode, that was actually a great call, because if you see, it looks like he is literally doing the sort of trajectory step up that you would want, and he was already, like, borderline, like, star, superstar. Like, now it looks like he's just going to take that step up. So if he can do it, not just in the regular season, but in the playoffs, then they've got a chance. And I actually think this is another team where another mad underrated thing in the NBA is what does your actual starting five look like? This starting five is pretty nice, like you're saying. Like, Carl Anthony Towns, another player, by the way, whose problem was if you put him on a bad team, which the Timberwolves for a long time obviously were, and then he's supposed to be like a 1A option. He isn't. Like, it just, he just never made it quite like that sense. Like, he was good, but he wasn't as good as the other people who played his position and was slightly better. So it was like the real problem was you had someone who was like the fourth best in the league at their role, and then you were treating him like he's supposed to be like fucking a super carry, which he wasn't going to do. He doesn't have to do that at all at this point in his career. Like you see, in this team, it's just about find your spot and get like 10% better than you're doing now and we're cooking with gas you look at the rest of the team like Mike Conley is just a veteran ball handler he's just always been a solid player yes we all know he got that utterly criminal contract years ago because of the fucking Grizzlies but that that's actually overshadowed that he's just a guy who knows how to play basketball he's just a good player so yeah. to me like the, the start of five is good mate like a lot of it is going to rely like you say on Anthony Edwards but you think about it otherwise like I, I, we've discussed it on past episodes Rudy Gobert is just a sleeper OP player in the NBA so no I think I agree they should definitely be a playoff team how far they go yeah it probably is matchup dependent and then also I won't blame Anthony Edwards if he doesn't ball out in the playoffs at age 22 years old like I'll, he can be forgiven a year or two because like just the tracking just looks awesome right now yeah what, what's not to like what's not to like right here's one then because here's the thing this is where you'll notice I am consistent with when I think moves didn't work out and then they also didn't work out Right, spoiler, my other two Dark Horse teams are just the Suns and the Mavs. 
And the only mm. reason, like, here's the problem. The Suns are a legitimate dark horse. Like, they, again, they have, like, a better version of what the fucking Clippers had. You know, the Clippers, I said, have, like, some really good pieces, but it's like, can you figure out the puzzle? In theory, there's not a puzzle for the Suns. I do hate the idea ever that, like, Booker or fucking Durant aren't the main guy with the ball in their hand. I don't like that, but whatever. In theory, they're making that work. The rest of the team actually looks like it could all work together. Like, why can't Bradley Beal play with them? Like, you know, that, that all looks looks great on that team. Like, that all looks like they can have a very strong team overall. My problem is this. I do think... I was shocked, dude, when I looked at some of the teams in the betting. This team was, like, third in betting to win the title. What? Mm. Like, that seems a bit wild to me because oh. I, I haven't seen anything yeah. that told me that. Like, look, the pieces are potentially great. Like, yeah, if it all comes together, it could be awesome. But I think that's way too high. For me, they'd be more like, like, you think about where I'm putting them. They'd be like the seventh or eighth team that I'd take. And let's be real. I'm largely, at the moment, just going off the idea that, like, I know the like I know Kevin Durant is one of the best players ever. He can ball out in the playoffs. I'm pretty sure Bocker will be pretty good. He's looked better and better each playoff season. The others, I've got to see, like, how does it work with Bradley Beal on this team? He was, I thought he actually was underrated on the other team. He was a pretty fucking good player. He just never got the shine for whatever reason. So the problem here is, again, it's another... It's going to be the uh, same when I talk about the Mavs in a minute. It's like, how do you make use of the pieces you've got? That's my only problem. And then also... I just feel like the flaw we always have, it's a bit similar to Counter-Strike All-Star teams. It's like, the more of the stars you stack, it's almost certain one or two of them have to give something up. They can't really just really maintain those stats. Because people do act like when you put three of the four of these players, that they all just get to average 25 points. Now. And it's like, well, if that was true, there's 100 points a game already, so you wouldn't need a bloody rest of your team, would you? Like, It's not actually Space Jam, guys. You actually do need a bench, fucking rotations. There's only one ball, so... The, the key thing for me is I just can't ignore the firepower. Like, if they did get it together, this team could beat a lot of squads. It's just tough for me to really grade the Suns right now because what Booker's only played two games. Uh, Beal's only played one. They haven't, they haven't played together. So I, I don't know what this team is, is yet. From before, like, in terms of... I, I probably would have even had them a little bit higher before the season started. So, yeah, I, Dark Horse is a fair place to put them. I kind of... if. Before the season started, I actually kind of had them as contenders in my eyes when I was talking to friends about this team. But I mean, I, on paper, I it does look sick. It's a great lineup. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the the fact that they're using, what, Nurkic instead of DeAndre Ayton also, it, I'd say Nur, uh, Ayton was a better defensive center, but he, then he had those weird issues where he just wasn't getting enough use. But it's like, dude, you're playing next to, like... You're playing next to Booker and Durant. Like, what do you, you what do you, like, we're not going to draw, they're not going to draw plays up for you. Like, you have really good, you have, so, you have two guys, one guy that's a transcendent scorer next to you, might be the best in the league right now. And then you have one guy that's, you know, coming up to be a top seven scorer in the league. Like, you, I'm sorry, you're not going to touch the ball too much. And so Nurkic is, I don't, I, I don't know exactly yet, like, if he's the right fit, I kind of just wish they kept Aiton over over and like made it work out. Whereas Nurkic to me has never really been as good of a defensive center as Aiton has. So that's probably going to be the one Achilles heel for me with this team is that the the defense. I'm not it's just I just I can't really put them in my contender category because their their defense to me is going to be flawed. Like I, I don't see a defense of Booker, uh, Beal and Nurkic to be locking everybody down. Durant can turn it up to be a good defender, but he's not usually your best defender. And if he's, to me, he might actually be the best defender on the starters right now. So that's that's uh, that's not what I want from a from a contending team. And so I'm, I, I'm really, really curious still to see this team play out like actually as their starting five though. And then like I say, since I put them in, I'll do them as well. And then I also have the Mavs for similar reasons. But here's the problem. The Mavs is like my most debatable. Like I could knock this off dark horses as well and just say they'll just be a playoff team or do nothing. My problem with this team is this. If somehow either jo Doncic and Irving play amazing or they just figure out some way to coexist, they are both insanely good basketball players. But the downside is, one, Doncic just is not an elite defender, so you're not getting the two-way game. And two... I have to say, I think, I, I've said this when this move happened, I just can't conceive of how these two players specifically can look in the mirror and go, yeah, awesome move, let's play together. It's like, bro, you have to be two of the most ball-dominant players in the entire league. Like, you're the guys who want it 100% of the time in your hands. And you're also going to, like, especially Irving, he does, like, that thing where he does one million fucking moves before he does a shot. Like, I just don't see generally how you can make that work and actually win the championship. Like, I think, 
this way. I do think they're such good players. You should at least be a playoff team. You should maybe even win a series. But, like, I don't know how these two can win together. And like I say, I don't really know, like, like how have we fixed the defensive issues the Mavs have? Because the Mavs also, as, as no one ever seen, this is why I, I know people watch yeah. highlights and they don't watch the games, dude. Even in the highlights, haven't you noticed how Doncic always has to like win a close game by hitting like five three-pointers and some crazy shot? Like, yeah. He's never like, yeah. and the, to blow him out, he just put in three at the end. Like It's always like, this. it's that, it's so difficult for them to win games because they're another team that's doing, like I said earlier, Maui, like they're doing that thing of like, yeah, but we can score 120. It's like that half the league <laughs> can. The question is, can you stop the other guy scoring 120? Five. That's a more pertinent question. And that's where if you're the Mavs, I don't know that you can. And then lastly, I'll just throw this in there. Bro, at least these other super teams have some wiggle room. Like I said, the Clippers actually have offset the injury issue. Bruh, if Kyrie Irving tweaks even a fucking muscle in his foot, this whole thing's over. It's over tomorrow. And, bo- and spoiler, anyone who's followed his career knows he is also absurdly injury prone. I mean, I'll just say it right out straight up. I think at this point in time, he may be even exaggerates them, if you know what I mean. Like, I've seen too many players yeah. play through what seemed like insane injuries. Meanwhile, some of these guys, it's like, some of them can take weeks off for nothing. And then obviously, as an aside, even though it has nothing to do with the modern day, he also did fuck his whole career by that whole period where he could only play half the games for the fucking Nets or whatever. So like, in general, the, I think uh, Kyrie Irving is an overall player is only ever overrated or underrated. He's overrated because some people think he's like, I mean, he does have insane handles, but some fans probably think he's like secretly the best player, but he's probably underrated in the sense that like, he just hasn't even had proper seasons for years now. Like no. if he actually plays a normal season and he can play like 75 games and he can coexist, they have like, at least they can be fun. Let's put it that way. They'll be fun. I don't think they can win though, personally. I think this team can't win. Uh, first off on the 75 games thing, Kyrie has only ever played 75 games or more once in his career, and he played 75. He, uh, for the last there six seasons. <laughs> for the, yeah, for the I think that season, arbitrarily puts a pretty good one. Yeah, go on. <laughs> he, he, uh, he literally, he's played 60 or less games every single season, and the most he played was six. He played 61 time in the last six seasons. Like, he, yeah, it's always something, some off-the-court issue with, with Kyrie. That's why it's really hard to actually believe that they're going to be content and even if he's on the floor, then you have two guards that aren't really great defenders in Doncic and him. So, uh, yeah, like it's it's just like a pure firepower type type of lineup. I will say that from the the little I've caught of of the Mavs so far, this uh, this Derek Lively, the second guy, like their their new center that they they got is pretty darn good too like he might he might be a contributor to winning basketball i've only seen like a little bit like he run, he's like really athletic and he can play pretty solid defense overall so i think that when he's paired with luca you have a nice like little little pick and roll game you have a you have a guy that seems to be I, i'm not even really sure who were like the like all the contributing members were because it was always just the Luca show for me when I was watching this team. But I think that guy might develop to be a third star for them. But actually, I'm, I've just looked it up. I mean, like, this guy has just been drafted. He's like a teenager. So like that's kind of something on the books for the Mavs. And maybe you'll expect something out of him for the future. But I don't really I guess Dark Horse is Dark Horse is fine, but I would probably put I'd be willing to say they're probably actually in the lower category for me. I think they're going to do worse. I think that this is a good start to the season for them. What, they're 6-2? and two, But I, I don't think that they're... One, one, they're not continuing at this pace. I think they're going to probably end up the season with like 40, 44 wins. I'll say 44 wins, yeah. I mean, remember, the, the other thing about this team, which should also add in for this specific team, is this is where playing the West also kills you. Like, the West is too stacked still, guys. Like, there's some very good elite Eastern Conference teams, but the problem with the West always is how deep it is in terms of teams. It means that if you're like a touch-and-go team like we're talking about, dude, it's hard to get that eighth spot. Like, you never quite know where yeah. it's going to be. Is it going to be like 46 wins? Is it going to be like 44? Is it going to be 50? You never know. You get a bad season where too many of the big signings work. Do you have anyone else in your dark horse? Did we miss anyone? One, one, just like the way I would sum up the Mavs, the Mavs is that the Mavs are a team though that like I can expect them to actually beat anybody. Sure, but they, they over the course of a series, I think they should lose to almost uh, most of the people I've conti- I've uh, mentioned as contenders or even other dark horses. It's why I actually think unfortunately Doncic is a little bit overrated. What he's essentially done is he's won a bunch of the big televised games, or like the big marquee match, and so because he's done that a few times, it makes people think he's already the best. Whereas it's like, yeah, yeah, he definitely has games that are bad or inefficient or just all right, you know. Yeah, in terms of other dark horses, like I, I was looking through a lot of 
these other teams that kind of started off to like really like surprisingly decent records, but it's pretty tough for me to really pick any of them out and be like, yeah, I'm loving, I'm loving what I'm seeing. I mean, I, I was pretty high before in another one of our podcasts about Tyrese Halliburton, who is continuing to play very well for the Indiana Pacers. I don't think as a whole that the Pacers are a team that I really want to dive into, but uh, they're, they're one that I'm going to keep my eye on. I think they're going to make the playoffs in the East, but I don't think they're going to like a dark horse, like means I have some idea in some way that they could punch up but i just, i just don't see that happening so not really right as i say the other category i had i only have two teams in there though is i just did one where either they'll flop or they'll just underperform for what people expect so i have two teams here and i just did the lakers and the heat so i think mm-hmm. the heat's the obvious one yeah. but we'll do that second the lakers i'll just go like this one I actually think the real joke is, even though every fan and everyone in the media, by the way, I, I, as a quick aside, I don't know how much you've followed this. Dude, I actually haven't followed like the gossip of how like the NBA media is done. I couldn't believe this shit when I looked into it. It's real. You know, half this shit these last few years is because LeBron's fucking agents basically just like run the NBA and just do all these like deals with people, clearly for like media access. And so that's why everyone just still sexes all the LeBron narratives up like 10 times over or makes it sound like he's got no help. And all this. this is fucking mental. Like, I, it, it, it always seemed astroturfed. But like, now I get I thought it was just fans that were motivating that because... Dude, people, LeBron fans talk stupidly. Like the way he plays now justifies him being the GOAT. Bro, he would actually have a way stronger GOAT candidate case if he retired five years ago. Five years ago, I'm saying. Like basically almost right after he won the championship and didn't win the World of the Warriors. Here's why. Because now in his game, he's had all these seasons where he has the pieces where it's like that guy used to be an all-NBA player three seasons ago. So if you can sort of rehabilitate him and make him a piece on the outside. By the way, exactly what the narrative of LeBron's career is supposed to be. Like he'll make the people around him better. He'll make the right pay, the choice. He'll pass when he's in a dodgy spot. Like, that doesn't work these last few seasons. It just looks bad. Like, the Lakers basically is just LeBron has the ball all the time and does whatever he wants. And quite frankly, now has become like, he's actually degraded, dude. He's gone back to like what he used to be in like the 2000s. He can only go straight to the basket or pass the ball. Like, his mid-range game has just fallen off a cliff to an insane degree. Like, I don't know if you've seen some of the stats. Bro, he is an insanely bad shooter from, like, beyond three feet up to, like, three points. He's not bad at three points. He is terrible. Like, he doesn't have a mid-range game. And so the problem is, I I do feel like, unfortunately, he wants to pump his stats up. And it's just making his game look mad, mad inefficient. Like, he's not... I actually think now he has had the help, in my opinion, the last few seasons. I think these are just players where they wither on the vine when they play with him. So the LeBron angle's not great. Like, people are like... You know that whole thing, like, if you've got LeBron James, you get a chance to... That is... That ended years ago, guys. Like that was the that was the case for like 10, 15 years. That isn't the case now. Now he's just one of a bunch of good players in the NBA. And by the way, some of the names we mentioned in this show are better than him. I know like in their career they're not, but they are right now in the NBA. And then the other thing is, I do still think Anthony Davis still has you see it from down. He still has some of the most insane potential of any player I've ever seen in the NBA. I think he's like I actually think, by the way, he was fucking sick in the playoffs last year. I thought he was actually balling most of those games. He was, he was mega. The problem is he's just a head case and an injury prone player. That's a nightmare right there. Like with him, he's even worse than Kyrie Irving. Like if I can just get this guy to play sixty games a season, Maui, I'm probably like on a good season for him. And then like like I say. He's just got one of like the weakest mentals I've seen. I d- one of the things I'll never understand about players like that is, I really just want to sit them down and go, dude, do you not know who you are? Like, let me show you for game footage of you playing. Like, this is here all day long. You can eat these. This is fucking, what's it, Shaq's? This is like fucking like barbecue here right now, mate. You can just, you can just eat these guys up. But he's one of those guys who just has times where he just it seems to think he's half as good as he is. So like the, La- the sad thing about the Lakers, as always is, there's always like some potential, some chance. I think they're going to flop personally. Like, I think there's a chance they either like borderline don't make the playoffs or they just go out first round like and, and I think a lot of what's carrying it is people are just still riding like the LeBron narrative it was like, to me it's I don't think that even the fact is in at this point in time he's just not the player he once was he's just a good player now uh, yeah I, I well I from what I've seen with the Lakers I think well LeBron LeBron is still to me like a top one of the he's not elite but he's in that category right beneath elite but then you really do need Anthony Davis to be your elite player if you actually want to yeah. have aspirations to win a championship and that's not really where I would place the Lakers right now. Like, I don't think the I like. This is 
like like what you're saying with Anthony Davis is so it's so on the nose, but it's also like really sad because oh, is I, it. <laughs> it, it's weird because he'll he'll he has like a really solid mid range game, but sometimes he'll just miss one. And I just don't see him touch the ball enough late after that. Like he'll try to do something too different. But the thing is that I love that Kobe quote that, you know, he'd rather see that he had a three and 24 yes. shooting night as opposed to a three and five night or three and six or whatever, whatever, three and yeah, eight, yeah. because it just means that you gave up at some point. And I feel like Anthony Davis kind of just nerfs himself sometimes where yes. he doesn't he doesn't take all the shots that he definitely could in a in a game, even though he's in position, he's taller, he's bigger than some of these other people that are defending him. But just like I think it is a mindset thing for him, which is really disappointing when he's supposed to be uh, just such a trans. I mean, I thought he was going to be a transcendent player also. Yeah. Uh, and I I think He's safely like top 125 of all time, but I wouldn't really put him in like the upper echelon there by any means. No, the sad thing is to me, Anthony Davis, if he actually had like lived up to his potential, dude, he was supposed to be like a better version of Kevin Garnett or something. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he actually had like serious, crazy potential. As we say, I mean, the joke is you don't even need to get into the mental stuff. He just doesn't physically get on the court enough. By the way, another player where I'm just going to say straight up, I don't believe it, Maui. Like, you're telling me if these guys played in 1980 where he got paid fuck all money. And by the way, remember, this is another, this is a real problem people don't know about the NBA. You know, the NBA, you get paid like to actually play the game as well. Like, if you don't play the games in theory, yeah, I yeah. think you, you don't get the money off, whatever, right? The problem now is that doesn't matter if you get 100 million. You just go, lol, who cares? Like, you would care if you were getting a million dollars and that was like a cut of it, you know, like you'd fucking play the game. Because I just, I also don't believe that, like, how can how can everyone simultaneously tell me, Maui, that all the players now are stronger, faster, with better tech, but they're all injured all the time? What is this? Like, bro, players got injured like half as much when I used to watch the NBA in the fucking 2000s. Like, everyone just played every... And also, I'm not going to do like a whole load management rant, but like, they do it like in such a cynical way now. Like, because what's mad is they really do think of like, yeah, but we're saving for the playoffs. It's like, this is like the last big game against somebody you might play in the playoffs. So you try and win that one for like psychological edge and stuff. Like, that's another thing. Because so the Anthony Davis also lined up with the era when people just don't mind that you don't fucking play the game. Like, that's another thing. At this point in time, people deserve like a bloody award for just playing 75 games a season. Like so LeBron also yeah. fucking going to load management like a motherfucker. That, that, by the way, that's the most whack angle ever. When they keep telling me, yeah, but look at his longevity. Bro, he just takes fucking two third. He takes a third <laughs> of the season off every year. So logically, he's stealing a year every three. And you're giving him credit for playing extra years. Like, what is that? You know, there's that stat that Michael Jordan played something insane, Maui. Like, nine seasons where he played, like, 82 games or something. Something bonkers like that. Like, he, guy basically never sat out. It's why, by the way, he probably does have the most insane, like, eye test goat case ever. Because Michael Jordan doesn't have any excuses. He never did that thing of, like, oh, but he, he's going to turn it on the play. He just turned it on every game of his whole career from the beginning to the end. You might not like some of the things he did or said, but he never shortchanged you ever. He never sat out on some bullshit injury. He never got like a diva here, and th it essentially just played basketball. And so, unfortunately, a lot of the other people, when you add some of the, like some of the Lakers ones, are the great examples. Like it, they just look bad in comparison. They just look silly in comparison. Like I still don't understand. To me, it's the opposite, dude. I would here's a here's a good take for you. I actually think LeBron should have been doing the opposite. He should have been going for like the Karl Malone, like you never miss a game Iron Man record. You know what I mean? Mm. Where you just play like a thousand games or whatever. Like he could have done that. Yes, the skill set too. He also, by the way, the thing I've always thought is sus as fuck, is he'll simultaneously claim to have all these injuries, but at the same time, that doesn't make sense because he does look like he's superhuman, bro. Like, he doesn't get properly injured. But it's like they do just selectively... Use, they just use the injuries as an excuse, bro. Because, it like... Dude, wasn't it this off-season where he claimed to actually have, like, a torn muscle and have no surgery and then just... I'm better now. It's like, what? what? Either that's fake or you're superhuman. Which is it? Like, what is this? What is that angle? Yeah, yeah. The, I actually that's a fun, that's a fun point. The one about like just the way that LeBron could have just Iron Man this whole surely this whole thing. wouldn't it be like the best like, candidate ever to do it? Especially in the modern day, we don't get hit that much. I think he could have just played every game properly. Yeah, because actually, I mean, I'm looking at it right now for career le re uh, career leaders for total games played. Carl Malone has played three less seasons it's than LeBron, and he has 50 more yeah. games than him right it's now. It's because so. until basically, as and far as I know, the last season when he got injured, I think he just played every game. Dude. He just played, He used to just suit up every single game, basically, yeah.
And they're a good analog because they're both insane physique as well. Look at them. They're they're both like gods, aren't they? What's what is insane when I actually look at this is that is that um yeah oh 19 my bad 19 seasons for Carl Malone two of the seasons only two of these 19 seasons did he have under 80 games played isn't that insane that's so crazy it's bonkers isn't that's it actually that's so insane and he's averaging 37 minutes per game yes in over over 37 minutes per game throughout his entire career that is so crazy to me um yeah okay um i'll go with a i'll go with a flop team um this team has just been laughably bad to watch and i just uh i think that people have seen like the low lights but just like if you actually really tune into them just how how bad they are is is it's just like you should just watch a game just to see this because they the the washington wizards are so disgustingly bad that like it's not even just the highlights you see of maybe jordan Poole uh just trying to just lackadaisically take taking a shot here or there it's just like the way the offense is run like you, you're not it's not just him it's kyle kuzma also like kyle kuzma as supposedly your best or second best player this team is just a walking disaster and it's 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 frankly just funny to see how how much like a team that you wouldn't really care about anyways because last season what it was just like pool and Kristaps Porzingis who now are should be playing on teams that are playing winning basketball you you substitute them with people that are playing the same position in pool and Kuzma but just how bad the NBA goes in terms of depth and like just how how much they don't care I there, there there's simply not a ton to say about this team other than just if you watch 10 minutes of their starting lineup, you will see some of the worst decision making in terms of passes, in terms of missed assignments on defense, in terms of no one coming to help, in terms of one guy holds the ball like outside the three point line and the de- the offense just doesn't move to help him and they just get a turnover because they just try to wink like sling a pass somewhere. The team is not only just bad players in terms of mentality, I think they're horribly coached too. So that's where uh, it, this isn't a surprise or it probably shouldn't be a surprise that, but I think that there there were a few people that actually were talking about especially especially in preseason when when pool had this like third or 40 point outburst game and or whatever like they were saying oh maybe maybe take a flyer bet on on Jordan Poole to be the scoring leader in the NBA it's not happening like he's it's, he's not going to i i don't think he's going to come close like he he might their performance <laughs> might get a little bit better over the season but they are just disgustingly bad at basketball and uh it's almost funny that like a professional team can put this out on the floor like, obviously, with the way the offseason went, like, they did just give their best player away, basically. So, like, spoiler, they were never going to be good. But I also think, to touch on what you're saying, dude, Kyle Kuzma and, and Jordan Poole, in terms of modeling, are the same player. They're people who are like, oh, there's a lot of potential. Just wait and give them a chance. It's like, how much more? Like, with Kyle Kuzma, he's already had the chances, mate. Like, he just isn't a fucking star player in the NBA. He's all right. That's why on a garbage team, he's going to get some points. He has, like, some skills, some and then Jordan Poole, I mean, as you say, he had a very real chance. Forget all that stupid shit with the Draymond thing. That wasn't really what made it live or die. He actually had a real chance. I and mean, they've tried, like I say, with the Warriors, they've tried out so many people for that third option. But he just didn't quite make it when he needed him to. Like, he never, like, they gave him the room. He didn't blossom like he was supposed to. So I agree with you as well. The real joke is. Like you say, Jordan Poole should be fucking balling out of control on this team. He should actually be doing what Kyle Kuzma does, plus more. He's a better player, but he isn't. Like, it just shows, essentially, he's just a limited player. Like, something's gone wrong in the development of these guys. And then the rest of the team is just trash. This team's just fucking bad. Like, I, like here's one of those ones where you just hope, the only silver lining is, you just hope, in light of the trades they made, that essentially the GM himself knows, like, this is a tank year, and then you, you build back up with some picks in future years, and, you you know, we know this isn't going to be a real team now, because, like, there's nothing to even watch on this one. By the way, that's also the downside. Here's why you don't want a million super teams, because the whole premise of how the NBA and franchise leagues were actually invented in America is so that every Every team has like a good player. This team doesn't have any because the joke is the good players are like third or fourth option on the bloody top teams. Like in the old NBA, there would be a player on this. I mean, the joke is it was Bradley Beal, but you know what I mean? There'd be like some player that was good on this team that could do something. But they, like, there's nothing to even watch on this squad. There's garbage, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they're just they're just horrible. Right, like, I'll do I've a pro- quick watched... one. Uh, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. I mean, I just watched like 15 minutes of this team and it was just the worst basketball. I'm going to see this whole season. If people wonder why, how could I pick a team that was in the NBA Finals as a flop team, the Heat? Because again, how did they get there? 
Right, first of all, they didn't even beat the Celtics. The Celtics beat themselves. That's just the way that went. And then secondly, that was actually generally the story. That's why people were loving the whole Jimmy Butler angles. They played a lot of teams that got really fucking scared and played like shit down the stretch or had a perimeter player who literally buckled because Jimmy Butler implied he would beat them up. By the way, remember, no one's beating anyone up in the NBA. You get you get banned for gate. This isn't 1980. Like, remember, back in the day, you didn't even get like a flagrant foul when you punched someone. Nowadays, if you punch someone, you're probably out two games at this point in time. Like, you ruin your whole team. So that's not even real. But fair play, that angle worked at that time. The, the, if you look at the Eastern Conference now, that is not going to work again this time around. And the problem that he always had, like I said before, is they're like a defensive team. They don't have crazy firepower. They don't have like, they're not the team that's going to put 130 on you because you put 120 on us. That's not who they are. And so the other problem I think they have is I actually think essentially their strengths don't really fit the modern NBA. Like, who is their actual best player? Like, if, if we do any of the metrics you do for a matchup, Maui, so team versus team, they shouldn't win. Star player versus star player, bro. We can go pretty deep on all the stars that are going to beat theirs. Even you look at starting five, like they have players that play together well. They don't have some killer starting five. Like this is not a bad team. Whoever GM'd it probably did an all right job. But this was the team where the whole story of this season is we didn't get Damian Lillard, so oh well. And by the way, we're not going back to the finals yeah. again. You know, that was great that you made it that one time. You're not going back again. That's a dream. You're not doing it. Yeah, and it's also weird that for for this team, it's not like Butler just continues his playoff form. Like it's he always I mean, chills we, in the regular season. Yeah, it's just we, who he is. I mean, we we harp on LeBron because the standards are so much higher because he actually has the capability to win a championship for him. But then there's no real outcry for Jimmy Butler for just taking the regular season off either because people are like, "Yo, he's Himmy Butler and he's going to turn it up or whatever." Yep. But it's like you're you're, you're probably not even going to make the playoffs. You're going to no, no. like this. So this is just, it's just super disappointing. Um, I know that the, like the, the heat lately, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, I guess, I guess not really not getting Lillard is, is it, it's too unfortunate that for them that just felt like an all or nothing. Like, but I also think that when, when you watch this team, like they're, they're really, they're really not that great. I guess, I guess, I guess Lillard would help their offense. So it's it's unfair to say that they would get much better. But right now, their offense is not great, and it's like, is Butler gonna still is Butler gonna give more effort if they get Lillard? Like, is that is that how this guy operates? Because if so, that's really, I also just don't really respect that either. Right. All right. The last thing we can do then is, who is your MVP? Who do you think will be the MVP? Or who would you make a case to be the MVP? Uh, um, I mean. The homerism runs really deep on this, but I actually do believe it. Like, I, I don't see, like, Curry, Curry, right, Stephen Curry is putting up 30 points per game right now. Uh, he is definitely the reason the Warriors are 6-3. and three. And when you actually look at the other players, like, you're talking about most valuable player as the best player in the entire league. I'm a little bit more reserved on that. I, I, I actually kind of think it's a it's a combination of factors where it should be overall how good this player is but it should also involve like winningness too and it should also involve if this person weren't on the team can this team even function and if there's no like steph curry the drop off between steph curry and clay the last time i checked it was bigger than any other top scoring star on a team to second highest scoring star on a team it off is, the top of my head i think he might actually have the highest plus minus i think i saw some stat like that I might be wrong, okay. but if you look it up, it might be, it might be right. Okay, on top. Know? Okay, well, on top of that, it, I mean, it's just like the difference in scoring per game between Steph and Clay is fourteen points. It's it's Steph is scoring thirty points per game, and Clay is scoring sixteen as the second leading scorer. Behind that, it's Jonathan Kaminga with twelve points per game. It's not even close. How much of the offense Stephen Curry has to shoulder? For this team to even be functional right now and that's unfortunately a testament to how poorly wiggins has been playing who was averaging i think like 17 last season i think clay himself had a little bit of a regression you don't have jordan pool who was soaking up some of those bench minutes where he would just be able to like you know go human torch on some some backup unit that's not going to play great defense or anything like that and that's and so for me it, it, it's stephen curry um he's he's already had some some really really strong outings throughout the season uh, like he's like, like 
30 he got got 34 against detroit and he he's shooting above 40 percent from three like in every game that he plays to and everybody knows what he's gonna do you know at some point there was a narrative that was if steph if everybody starts knowing you're gonna do this surely you're gonna be able to stop him They, they still can't stop this guy and he's still incredibly undersized and you look at some of the other players in the nba nba that are just like you know having these breakout or not breakout but just like leading the league in scoring and there's just nobody like curry still to this day and the the fact is that steve Steve kerr created an offense tailor-made to not just get curry activated but to activate other players and also that's another reason why i kind of talk about this this value on the team because the system wouldn't work if if stephen curry weren't here because he creates so much space for everybody else on the team and he draws so many doubles even when he's playing from the perimeter like it's usually usually double teams are drawn once people start getting to like mid block or like like at least in the paint or something like that with steph it's it's all day the thing is i actually think curry has a similar problem to durant which is Dude, these guys could legitimately have like five or six MVPs each. Meanwhile, between the two of them, they have three, which yeah. is just shows the way the NBA does work off having the best record or, I mean, let's just face it. Like, it's not like they're not deserving winners, but I think half of the reason Giannis and Jokic won is just that the media wants to do the narrative of it's not an American player. It's not a, it's not a traditional player. It's like some, mm-hmm. it's almost like, as mad as it is, because obviously normally you don't apply woke things in this area. It's almost like they're trying to do a diversity angle on the bloody NBA, which is like, what? But okay. Luckily, those are two people who are good though. Like, I think the Giannis ones, I wouldn't have given them all of them. I think the Jokic ones are all legit though. I actually think, like I say, basically, if Curry and, and or Durant's teams have enough wins, they're both totally viable winners. They're both basically cheat codes in the NBA who just score at will and could basically do whatever they want and can both be the best player in the NBA. I actually do think if they were to get... I would I would probably pick Jokic to win again. I actually think he's a rare example mm-hmm. of when like they got it right, basically. Because here's what's funny. I, I, I don't think he's getting the MVP for either reasons I give him it. I think the reason he wins the MVP, and I learned this from the Russell Westbrook and LeBron season, Seasons, is he's just basically combined all the things that make the NBA m- media horny. So simultaneously, he's going to have among the highest points in the game. They love fucking point scoring. But at the same time, they have this weird thing. Like, this is why it was so silly, by the way. They did that on the Westbrook season, but then no one else ever. They acted like for that season, a triple-double was the most OP thing, but then they don't give a fuck when anyone else gets them. So he also, by the way, puts up loads of assists and functional assists at that. And then last he has the Steph Curry thing of his field goal percentage is insane so if you add all those three together he has another very strong chance as long as the Nuggets are a top team to win the MVP but the joke is I actually do think it would be reasonable like I actually do think if I'm picking a player right now to start especially bearing in mind people like Durant are quite old I'd pick Joker which is the player I'm starting my team with like it just seems like he's not only does he have amazing offense and like I said on past episodes I think he could score more if he wanted by the way if he had no help he, he could be way more selfish and he'd score slightly lower percentage field goal but he'd score more points it's easy. He could be a volume shooter if he wants. He's actually, if anything, being efficient while still scoring about as many points as you could ask someone a point. And then he does just run the whole team. Like, it is it is fucking... I, I don't rave too much about some of the, like, ball handlers because I think in the modern day, like, people's usage is too high. His is deserved. He just does make yeah. the smartest decisions I've seen in many, many years in the NBA. Like, the, like, put it this way, it is insane that someone who isn't a point guard has that kind of, like, vision and passing. It's just bonkers. I think he is just OP as fuck, Jokic, personally. Yeah, the the recent game against uh, the Warriors where the Nuggets played, the, the Warriors weren't playing with Draymond, but the Nuggets weren't playing with Jamal Murray. And so Jokic had to, again, like basically every single play, they were just running it through Jokic. And even when sometimes a player would bounce off of a Warrior defender and seemingly like lose their balance, Jokic would still deliver the ball right to their hands as they were cutting. And then they would just get an easy layup in that moment of separation. It's... He's so precise still with his passing, still so so few uh, times when he's actually making a mistake. And also, yep. like you're saying, when he needs to score and there's no one that's getting open, like sometimes there's no movement across the floor and then he just kind of puts the ball down, like just drops his shoulder a little bit, banks his way into the into the paint and then he just gets a, gets an easy bucket like he can do he seriously can do like he can't do everything but what he is doing 
in terms of like his what his skill set is like he just knows his limits so well and he knows how to use his body so well and that's something that so many big players nowadays just don't seem to they just never get the time to show that like there are other big people in the league that should be able to do stuff like this but other than like a, a handful like people like Embiid and Giannis for my money there there's so many that just seem like they get the ball like I think Gobert is the prime example and why people want to clown on him. It just doesn't seem like he knows how to throw his weight around. And Jokic is so good at keeping a low center of gravity so that he can just bully his way into the low block and then just do a little just finger roll off the glass or whatever it is. Because I do think as a final point that the passing is what makes his game a cheat code, basically. I think actually if you had the exact same skill set of offensive, but just not the passing, I actually think he'd be a way more neutralized player or someone who was just, you could put him on an island, he scores, but then the team doesn't win. Like, I, the, the other thing about him as well is, it's a bit like that thing I always said in CS that everyone copied off me, but it's a great point for the analyst desk that like, if you're a young player, the player you watch is device for like how you play the game, how you position. Or, this is the same shit with Jokic. Like, it is so obvious, literally, that whoever, whatever coach he had back in Serbia just taught him old school basketball fundamentals. Like, this is how a bounce pass works. This is when yeah. you do, like, the short pass. This is when you look for the guy in the court. Like, he just has all the basics of the game. That's the area where I would tell the other players in the league. Like, dude, you're probably more skilled than this guy, some some of the stars. Like, if you actually worked on that part of your game, that's when you become more OP. Because the point is, like... The joke is the reason he doesn't shoot more like I want him to is because he's just so good with his vision. It's like the, the other guy's open who's passing him. Like, why not just pass it him at that point in time? So he's one of the rare players I've seen as well who, like, in theory, if he wanted to, he could lead the NBA but also still have fuck-all turnovers and pass awesome. Like, what more do you want? Like, he's just an amazing basketball player. Do you want to... I, I know the fans would want this and we didn't really talk about it before, but would you want to do a little Wemby segment? Oh, could do it, yeah, sure. yeah. Because so here's Victor the problem, Wimbledon. right? Obviously, we haven't seen many games and who gives a fuck about the preseason, right? The obvious problem with the framing of this Maui is the most recent player they did this with was obviously Zion Williamson. They did the same thing, right? A, a guy who, it's true, you look at like the, the frame they have and, you know, you compare them to analogs in history. It's mega tantalizing. Like, the problem is they already claim every number one pick can be like a great player. Obviously, they can't be. Like, everyone knows that in sports. But these are the players every now and then. Now, the reason I give the Zion Williamson one is... Obviously, in his case, he still never got through the injuries. He still never seen him play, just play a normal season. So that's one of those ones where it's like, they weren't lying, Maui. His skill set is bonkers. I do think Zion Williams does look like somebody you're making, like the create the player mode. That, like, if your mate made that and put him in the game, you'd be like, oh, well, if you're not going to be serious, I'm not playing then. But, like, he's a real player. But the, but, so the Wemby guy in a totally different body frame does line up in that sense. Like, obviously, the reason this is perfect for the Spurs as well is people just think it's the new Tim Duncan, don't they? Like, when Tim Duncan came along, it was the same shit. They were garbage. I mean, they actually literally tanked to get Tim Duncan, but we'll ignore that. They were garbage. Then <laughs> he came along. Immediately, he was good. He had his skill set there. So, like, it is an exciting one. My question for you is this. How hyped are you? Do you actually, like, do you buy the hype, for example, that, like, is he going to immediately, is this season he's already going to be good? Is he going to be like a borderline all NBA this season? Is that, do you think it works out like that for you? Are you super hyped for the generational talent aspect? I would say that he's in the top 65 players in the league. He's not top 15 okay. by any means yet. I, I would, the scoring, like his ability to just score at will is probably lightly overrated right now. Like his three point shot is not, is not as good actually as, um, it, people maybe kind of made it out to be and i think that's because what when you play i assume I, unless something has changed over the years that that you have a you can have a really good three-point shooting clip when you're playing in europe but the three-point line is a little bit closer than it is in the nba and I since so, starting yes. so since starting with the the eight games he's played so far he's shooting up beneath 30 percent from three right now like he's 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 making one and a half threes per game on five attempts so it's not like that's a little bit overrated like yeah he can always see over people but he just doesn't simply have that great of touch but i will say that when he gets the ball in transition and he's just in motion it he's clearly more nimble and coordinated than a lot of other people that came into the league with his size and i think of people like even Kristaps. i think of people like bol bol uh even like Giannis in the very beginning who just kind of like they just didn't seem to be as fluid but i think that Victor's footwork is much better. I was watching them play the Knicks uh, on Wednesday, and he had like some nice spin moves. Like he has, he actually has a bag, which is really impressive. I, I, um, so in terms of just like coming into the league and blowing us away, um, 
like he he is actually a, he's still a teenager like he's still he's still 19 right now which is crazy like he's and and there's no there's no other teenagers in the league that have been this good for a very long time i actually think the last good te teenager that was this good was legitimately Bre lebron i yeah. don't think there's been a good a, this right. good of a teenager so that's where it's exciting because you would hope that as long as he doesn't get injured and we have to keep bringing that up like we we seriously we simply have to keep bringing that up because people this big yes. are just not they're just not built to last like and especially the thing is that i think of all of a lot of the other centers in history who had the proportions of someone like victor like i think of like hakeem i think of kareem um like yao ming or whatever like some of the, like Something that they all did for themselves is they kind of just kept themselves planted. And that obviously didn't even work out for Yao. Like, he still got injured. But people like Kareem, who had good, better longevity, they, their game was a little bit slower. It wasn't so much based about, like, spin moves. It was just having the sky hook. It was about just playing good defense where you're just always kind of playing around the restricted area and just trying to block, like, you know, use your length to try to disrupt people as they're trying to come inside. But Victor is kind of like, he's trying to step around a lot. He's, he is doing a lot of, like, fancier footwork. And I, I just feel like he's going to step on someone's shoe one day and roll his ankle and it's going to be a fracture or a break. And I, that's where I'm like, I, 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 don't, I hate, I, I want to just, I want to just appreciate this right now, but I've never, I've actually never seen a guy with this length and the, the, how frail he's constructed move like this and not get injured. And that's where it's just, I'm always, I'm kind of wincing when I watch him, which, which sucks because some of what he's doing is fantastic. Yeah, the problem I have basically is I do think a bit like the Zion Williamson one, they have slightly overhyped it. Not even in the sense of like they can't be really good. It's just that like there's certain things you have to see them overcome. Like for example, I totally agree on the injury one. I was going to say the same thing. The real problem he has is his length is insane in his wingspan, but holy shit is he skinny. That is really fucking disturbing to me. Like the difference is even like centers who are like have long arms, usually they have like pretty fucking like big like ankle calls thighs like this guy's super lanky like that just has like you say rolling your ankle written all over him like that just happened at the wrong moment and also with that big body like you could easily get your foot in the wrong way in the restricted area you go for a rebound like the, the injury prone aspect is going to be so scary for this guy's career and then also people did overrate his offensive game right i saw people simultaneously making it like it's like kareem abdul jabbar mixed with kevin durant it's like first of all don't ever bring up kevin durant for a player like this kevin durant already had like almost like a, a complete offensive skill set upon entering the NBA like his three point shot was already good this guy as you say that part is far from established on his game his actual game when he's like close to the basket and around it is fabulous obviously that's where people are excited it does look like this guy has all sorts of like fucking like teardrop hook like close just put it back like by the way it also looks like the player that's going to get loads of points on putbacks and rebounds and offensive rate that which is all mega the key thing for me is what makes me hyped actually is that he went to the Spurs like dude if there's yeah. anyone I feel like actually could figure out how to make this guy like work in the system like actually get around some of his flaws and crucially he's one of the I think Popovich is one of the only coaches left in the NBA who won't just fucking like acquiesce to the ego of the superstar player like I think that's one of the reasons by the way why people like Kawhi don't, didn't stay on the Spurs like they want to live in this new world where you're the superstar and you just decide everything so actually I think it, the, one of the biggest like positives is that he has Popovich and the Spurs behind him and also because the team isn't mega now you notice we didn't list them in our, all those teams we were listening there's actually no pressure to be really good now beyond like the media thing like you're going to have time to breathe a little bit and build into your game and no one expects them to win the season anyway so you've got, you've got time to figure it out so I do think actually if he sort of knows his game it can be really good already. Like, I'm with you. He could already be, like, the 30th best player in the NBA if he figures out this season how to play within his game. But he clearly still has to uh, expand out a little bit. And I, 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 I'm with you. I also really am scared about the injury potential. I do agree, though, on the movement part. That is mad underrated. One of the reasons why just pure height alone isn't always, like, insanely OP in the NBA is because, dude, a lot of those big guys, like you say... They're a bit heavy-footed. Like, even when they move... I think even Jokic does this. One of the things about Jokic, which is why people say he's slow, even though I don't know if he's that slow, it's more like he just looks like he moves... He moves a bit like people do in the game Quake, where, you know, it has, like, an inertia to how you move. Yeah. And so, like, as you move, you sort of, it's like you just turn like that, right? 
his whole thing's like, it's like he body controls while moving like a fucking big jelly man. Like, this guy doesn't have that at all. It's crazy. He actually has like the body movement of a normal sized player, but he's just insanely lanky. So I actually do think, for me, I don't think this season will be it. But I do think, let's say in like two seasons from now, if he actually works on his game and Popovich gets him, he doesn't get injured, then, then he could be like the like sixth best player in the NBA. Like the potential is crazy. Because I also do think, if you're this player, by the way, fuck three-point shooting. Forget that. You don't need that. Just literally, just I just want you between the basket and like, what, nine feet out. That's your office. All day long, we're going to throw you the ball and or just get the rebound. Like you, this guy could be a really effective player in the NBA for sure. Yeah, you don't want to really go the way of Giannis where you're just a non-threat at all from three. And I mean... For for Victor's sake, he's actually already shooting better from three than Giannis really ever does. Like Gian- Giannis's best three point percentage season was actually he, okay. He had one season of thirty five, but he's usually I mean his career average is twenty eight percent. At this point, Victor's already shooting it a little better better of a clip. Like you need to just let the deep just because of like modern offensive schemes, you do need to space the floor and everything like that. If you're shooting above like just barely over thirty percent, but you have an inside game that Victor already has. Yeah, I just I wish he kind of just took less shots from outside because like so I just looked it up now, right? Numbers. He takes like five threes a game. And Beagle only many. takes like three point six and he took three last it. That's what you want to be at. Like you're saying, if you get yeah. a wide open one, you do it for the sake of the shot, yeah. But like you shouldn't be it shouldn't be a part of your game you're emphasizing. You don't need I, to. I, you're money no. on the basket. Why would you need to? I, yeah, the thing is, it's sometimes it's weird with Victor when I watch him. It's like he can't sometimes insert himself as close to the basket to get catch the ball from like the low block or anything like that. Like he's just he's just pushed out, and I think that probably has to do with his his higher center of gravity than than most NBA players. Or the, but but when I see him inside, actually, it's really impressive. He some it's like he doesn't even need to look at the basket, and he can still like sh- score behind yes. his head. He he can just like he just he just can reach his hand up and just has enough of a feeling and sense for where he's on the floor that he can just drop the ball into the hoop, and he does that pr- with pretty good regularity. And there's just simply nothing can anyone can do about no, it. No, like, no, you can't, can't defend it. You can't defend yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to foul. And so, yeah, and his free throw shooting is actually pretty good. So if you just just stay a good free throw shooter, just catch the ball a little bit more. I think that might be, though, slightly due to the the fact that the Spurs have been playing, um, what's his name, Sochan as, the, as like their point guard. And he's just kind of like can't even get the ball that easily. So people have to come help him more. I don't know. Like, I think the Spurs are trying a couple things at the same time right now. One, they're trying to get Victor Wembanyama acquainted, but two, they're using a, a six, eight forward as their point guard. And I think that's probably leading to Wembanyama not getting the best touches that he should be getting. So if they clean that up, just put, if you just get, if you just get a, better person to facilitate for the Spurs. I think that Victor's actually, I think his, I think his production can actually improve and his efficiency can improve too. Oh, one last thing I'll say as well is you're also right to like judge it like when you scaled it according to like LeBron's career. People have to understand this guy isn't even fucking 20 for another like 55 days or something like that. Like he is 19 years old, complete rookie. That means you didn't even do the years in college. So I'm also going to give him plenty of space to put like, like I said, that's why I put it like year threes when I'll start to like be critical. So uh, the, the initial signs do look awesome. Like this is actually a rare case where fair play to the media. They didn't go too crazy on this one this isn't like where they annually just say the number one pick will always be great whereas like the joke is like three years later some of them aren't even like a fucking guy who has the ball you know (laughs) (laughs) yeah